Welcome to the Bigfoot Case Files and Bigfoot Encounters narrated December giveaway. This is the third and final prize giveaway to end 2023 as a way to say thanks to all you wonderful subscribers for all of the support you've shown us. Listen carefully to find the secret word you'll need to know to comment down below to enter. The official rules and a list of prizes are in the description of this video. One winner will be drawn on the last day of the month to receive a personalized prize package put together by Shannon Morgan and myself. Thank you for participating and the best of luck to everyone. Merry Christmas. A Colorado ranching family deals with more than Bigfoot on their property. Many different cryptid creatures have been seen on the property, even during the daytime. This is their story. My experiences with the Yeti started when I was eight years old. I want to call them Yeti. You'll learn why later in the story. I live in southern Colorado, and I've never lived anywhere else. My story is one that is unique because I've never allowed these creatures to scare me off my family homestead. Most folks would have sold out long ago. My parents never believed me about what I had seen or what would torment me when I would do chores in the early morning hours. Chores were always started at 4 a.m. every morning. We operated a small ranch with cattle, pigs, horses, and sheep. It was a lot of work, but it was one that I enjoyed doing. My first encounter was in June of 1969. School had let out for the summer, and I loved going outside at night to play. It was so hot during the day, and we never had any air conditioning to speak of until I was older. I was sitting outside by our back door with my two dogs, one dog was an Aussie and the other was a Queenland's blue healer. They defended our livestock and us with their lives. The healer began to growl and I stood up to try and see into the darkness at what had him so upset. Each one of the dogs placed themselves on either side of me as I began to walk toward my dad's tractor, which was about 15 yards from the back door. We had three big cottonwood trees that were 20 feet from where I was sitting. As I approached the cottonwood trees, the dogs became aggressive. They were both growling in threatening tones and were still on either side of me. I stood peering into the darkness and my eyes adjusted as a creature stood up above my dad's tractor. The creature's shoulders were wider than the bucket of the tractor's front end and its upper body was more than three feet taller than the tractor itself. It had a huge head with no neck and my dogs by this time were going nuts but they never left my side. The creature roared at the dogs a horrible roar that vibrated through my body. So loud was the roar that it was painful, and I was sure this was the end for me. The dogs ran, and so did I, crashing through the back door. I fell flat on my face, screaming as my leg was caught in the screen door. I couldn't get my leg out, and I thought the monster had a hold of me and would jerk me back outside. My mother ran into the kitchen. She opened the screen door to free my leg, but she couldn't calm me, so she slapped my face that brought me out of my hysterics. But then I told my folks what I saw. They told me that I was imagining things. That was the start of many strange and unusual oddities that plagued me to this day. When I was eight years old, I thought a monster had settled on my river. I didn't know what I saw or what it could be. I didn't grow up with computers like kids have today, and there was never any time to go to the library to research what this thing was. Every morning when I went to do chores, the dogs were always with me, but they were always on high alert. As young kids, we were taught to pay attention to the livestock and our dogs. They would let us know of impending danger. In the mornings when I would do my chores, I would hear brush being smashed down and heavy walking approaching the back of the barn. The dogs would growl as a warning to me and to the creature that was approaching. My barns and corral sat next to the river bottom and my back pasture borders the river as well. The river bottom is thick with tamarisk trees, cottonwood trees, and many other types of trees and thick brush. We had our place fenced so that the livestock would not get out, so we could contain them for the most part from reaching the river bottom and escaping. On several occasions, one or more of these creatures would hit the back of our wooden barns with a stick or a rock or something while I was feeding the livestock. It would echo through the bottoms like a jet breaking the sound barrier. We were raised to never run from anything wild, and believe me, it took everything I had not to run. I continued feeding the livestock and I would head back to the house trying not to show any fear. 
these things would push over trees just to get my attention. I spent most of my young years scared to death of these creatures. I'm the youngest of three siblings. My sister is the oldest and ten years older than me. The high school kids would throw their graduation parties under the bridge and put their beer in the river to keep it cold. They would have a bonfire, roast hot dogs, and drink beer. Back then, you could drink at the age of 18. They would laugh and carry on, doing what kids do, paying no attention to their surroundings. In 1972, on a beautiful spring evening, a group of high school kids were partying under the bridge to celebrate graduation. I could see the bonfire lighting up under the bridge. One of the guys went to get some beer from the river. Something snatched him off the trail and he was thrown to the top of the bridge, which is 25 to 30 feet high. The young man was screaming and he hit the ground and the rest of the kids came running. He was scared to death. The impact broke his arm. He told the rest of the kids what had happened, but he had not seen what had grabbed him and threw him. They put out their fire, helped the kid to a car and took him to the hospital. The sheriff was called and he came rolling in the next morning to check things out. They wrote it off as a bear attack. A bear can't pick up a human and throw him that high. What nonsense. I knew what happened. I knew what had thrown him, but I never said a word. That was the last of the parties under the bridge. My father was a World War II vet and he was a no-nonsense man. His word was law and if he told you to do something, you did it without question. I tried to convince my folks of what was going on, but they didn't believe me. We lived in a two-story old house which was built in the early 1800s. There was no foundation, only large piers driven into the ground. My bedroom was on the ground floor, and the creatures would come to my bedroom window and tap on it. I was so scared. I would tell my mother about it, but she would say that it was just the trumpet vines that grew outside the kitchen window. I went outside to see if the vines could reach the top. They didn't reach my window at all. I tried pulling on the vines to see how far they would stretch, but they wouldn't reach my window. I would get into trouble for pushing my parents into believing me, and at some point, I just gave up. I decided to start taking a 22 rifle with me. We were taught how to shoot when we were small kids. Dad wouldn't let me take the shotgun because he was afraid that I couldn't handle it. It only took a day with the 22 rifle to understand that taking a rifle doesn't help when you're forced to set it down in order to pick up hay or grain and then walk away from the rifle to feed the animals. Something inside me always warned me not to shoot at them though, and to this day I have never taken a shot at one of these creatures. After a few years passed and I noticed that the creatures were not around my area at times. When the river became dead quiet I knew that they were back though. They had stopped making themselves known to me because I tried never to show a reaction to their threatening behavior. The creatures pushed me, pushed me hard enough that I wanted to cut loose on them with the rifle, but I never took a shot. I believe they found that I was not a threat to them after all. I'm assuming all this, but for the most part, they never attempted to harm me. We had a grain bin inside one of the sheep barns. My dad would grind his own grain to give to the sheep. The bin was made of concrete, and there was only one way in and one way out. I would never go in that grain bin to feed the sheep in the early morning hours, because I knew I would be trapped with no way out. My instincts told me not to go in there, and I didn't. We had a lot of livestock, and my parents had a 4-H club. My siblings and I showed animals all over our county. I was a paid horse trainer by the age of 13, and I would take on problem horses, Horses that would kill a person due to its owner's errors. I was familiar with all the folks in the local and state livestock community. During my time showing livestock at the county, state, and national level, I had the opportunity to talk to the native people who had booths and displays at various county and state fairs. Everything you know from TV and the internet about these creatures called the Bigfoot, I already knew years ago, thanks to the knowledge of the First Nations people that shared with me at the state and county fairs. According to them, they had many names for these beings. I told them that my creature had three toes. A yeti has three toes, they said. They warned me to always be aware of my surroundings and to never let my guard down. I learned so much from these special people that I would forever be grateful for all the knowledge they gave me and their support. I was breaking a young Appaloosa gelding that had a hard time crossing water. My training routine for these horses was to walk them down to the river through the brush and let them get accustomed to the water. 
Time and patience is what it takes with horses. It took a good 30 minutes to get him across the water, and we rode for a mile or so upriver. On my way back, I noticed that the river had become deathly quiet, so quiet that I could hear my own heartbeat. I started the horse off into a trot because I knew a yeti was close by. I could sense something was near, but I couldn't see it. As I quickened the horse's pace, I heard the brush 30 yards off to my right begin crashing under something heavy paralleling me. I kicked the horse into a gallop and then a dead run, and whatever was in the bush was running and keeping up. The noise it was making was unreal. We got to the water and the horse was spooked and was refusing to cross the river. My heart was pounding and I could hear the creature approaching. I never looked back to see how close the animal got to me because I was afraid and I kept urging the horse to cross the river. Finally, he took the plunge and we made it to the other side, making a mad dash to the mouth of the river that led back to my pasture. It took a long time for me to go back to that river after that episode. I never expected to have that close of an encounter, and I thought it was going to be my last. No one would have ever found me, that's for sure. It was unnerving. I was determined that these creatures were not going to keep me from my own land that I loved so much, but it was a few months before I gathered the courage to go back, but I did. After my encounter in the river on horseback, and a few months later during the Colorado State Fair again, I talked to the native Indians that were there at the fair. I told them what had happened to me. They replied that the Yeti, Bigfoot, and others are and always will be watchers of the forest, the rivers, and most wilderness areas. They stated that they respected these creatures and will not push their luck at all with them. I was advised to leave any area I suspected or had a sense the creatures were near. Their ancestors warred with these animals. Eventually, a natural line was drawn between them, and none of their kind would cross that barrier. I was thinking, well, heck, what am I going to do now? I can't just surrender my land to these things. I decided that I would continue to do what I've always done, and I would figure things out as I went along. By this time, I'd been around the Yetis for years, and I could sense when they were in the area. I didn't tell anyone about my encounters until I was married and had children of my own. It may seem that these encounters were everyday occurrences, but that was not the case. Nonetheless, it was common that I heard them breaking brush in the river in the early morning hours or late in the evening, and other small things that someone who was not looking for signs would ever notice. It is my experience that showing fear empowers these creatures even more and it seemed for a while that these things were going to work out. One thing that I always did, though, was they let me know when they were in my vicinity. When I was 14 years old, I was babysitting my nephew, who was 4 years old at the time. He wanted to go and throw rocks in the river, so I took him for a while, and everything was going great. It was the middle of July, and the day was growing hot. Pretty soon, I noticed that the area had grown quiet, and I knew that it was time to go. There was a loud crack in the thicket across the river, I grabbed up my nephew and ran all the way home. My brother and I got the binoculars out and got close enough to the river to see what was torn up. The creature had ripped a six-inch green cottonwood branch out of a cottonwood tree. These creatures always let me know when they're near, and that was too close for comfort. They didn't try and attack me or charge me, but they sure scared the heck out of me. Life went on, and I was soon married. Everyone in the area that I knew had grown up and moved away. The incidents on the river had stopped for a while, and everything was quiet on our place. My father was dying and asked me to move back to take care of my mother after he passed away. My husband and I put a 14 by 70 mobile home on the place. I had two small boys when we moved back, and I wondered if the creatures were still in the bottoms. I would go out in the evenings and early mornings to see if I could hear them, and all was well on our land. Everything was peaceful, and I could finally enjoy being there. When my oldest son was 14 years old, the Yetis made their appearance once again. This boy would have his first encounter with these beasts, and it was a violent one. I told my boys of the encounters on the river with the Yeti as a warning to them to be aware of their surroundings. After leaving home and going to college, I researched these creatures through Indian folklore. I learned a lot. They liked kids and cared less for adults. They seemed to be attracted to kids for some odd reason, maybe because they have trouble raising their own to maturity. My oldest boy had a friend stay over with him, and they went to the river to mess around. My oldest had a dirt bike, so the boys left on it to go explore. 
They went just east of the bridge, which was not my place, but they wanted to cross the river to explore the other side. It had been a wet spring, and the river was running pretty high, so they parked the bike and were going to cross the river on foot. My oldest happened to look across the river and up the embankment and saw a yeti standing there watching them. This creature was a sentinel. He was standing guard as the other creatures rested. My son tried to divert his friend's attention so he wouldn't see the creature, but his friend did see it anyway and went into hysterics. He was screaming and pointing, and then his friend took off running. My son ran to his bike as quick as he could and kick-started it and looked back and the creature was standing right behind him. My oldest took off after his friend and grabbed him up and got him on the bike. The Yeti took off running through the trees trying to cut their escape route, but my oldest spun the bike around and was able to get away. The two boys burst through my front door. My son's friend was hyperventilating and he was going into shock. My oldest explained quickly what had happened. I told him to call his mother and to get the boys some water and a wet washcloth, and I headed to the river with a rifle. I had never had them attack me, and if these creatures were that aggressive, then there was going to be one short in their clan. When I got to the area where the attack took place, I couldn't believe my eyes. In front of me was a horizontal tunnel through the tamarisk, the type of trees that grow in the river bottoms. Cutting a hole through them to make a tunnel-like shape would be very difficult, but there was one in front of me. I didn't know what to make of it. It was as if a horizontal whirlwind or vortex had shot through the trees and carved out a perfect tunnel. I looked down and I saw a fresh scat from an animal that I could not identify. A bit further, I saw a set of tracks. I had never found tracks and I had looked for them relentlessly. If these animals were living on my property, they had to leave tracks. I came from a hunting family and we all know how to track an animal and we know exactly what species we're tracking. This was my mindset for years but I never found a single impression that was not an animal I was familiar with. And out of nowhere, here are two well-defined tracks from a creature that has no identity in the books. When I got to the second track, the trail ended. It was as if the creature had vanished. I was stunned and I couldn't find any more. I scanned the area knowing that I would see one of these things, but nothing was there. I was angry and upset at the near tragedy and that I could not teach these beasts a lesson. I went to where the boys first saw the creature, the embankment, looking up. It was 15 feet tall. The river was running high and fast, and I saw no tracks running in either direction, but I was sure that the beast had gone back across the river. But I didn't have time to track the creature. I needed to get back to the boys and be there when my son's friend's mother arrived. Upon returning to the house, I found the boy's mother picking up her son. I tried to explain to her what had happened, and she called me crazy and sped away. I turned my attention to my oldest son to make sure he was okay. He told me that the creature was over seven feet tall, it had wide shoulders, and was really aggressive. I called my mother, and we went back to the area. This time, I brought a Ziploc bag to gather the scat I had almost stepped in. Finally, I had proof of the creatures that plagued me as a child, and I showed my mother. When we returned from the river, my mother called a good friend of hers that worked at the newspaper, who was a photographer. He came down and took pictures of the footprints for me, and he chewed my mother out for not documenting my stories. Mom told him that he could not print the stories, because he did not want the creatures hunted, nor did she want to deal with a bunch of people running all over her property, and he agreed. I turned my attention to picking up the scat that I had spotted earlier, and to my surprise, the steaming pile was gone. If you think these creatures are not intelligent, you would be wrong. There was no trace of that evidence anywhere. When animals get upset and then calms down, they excrete their bowels. It's just what animals do, and the Yeti is no different. The incident did not deter my boys from going to the river bottom, though, and I was relieved about that. Years later, I learned from my youngest son that the boy who had experienced the attack that day with my oldest required extensive psychiatric help. I felt awful about that, and because of that experience, their friendship ended. I was told that the boy never goes to a river of any kind, and he has a hard time hunting as well. I was sorry for what this kid had been through, and I didn't let anyone in the river bottom at all now on my property. There are neighborhood kids who knew the stories of this incident. They were raised on the river bottom, and this creature didn't scare them that bad. 
My boy soon came to realize that when the bottoms get quiet and the animals and no animals can be seen or birds stop chirping, that the creatures are there. I finally summarized that there must have been a leader change in the Yeti clan. This would explain the aggressiveness that was shown toward my oldest son and his friend. My youngest son, God rest his soul, was in the river bottom east of the river, sitting on a neighbor's tractor trailer flatbed. Our neighbors kept some equipment down there. He was 12 at the time, and he was sitting on the trailer, looking off into the bottoms. He witnessed a huge black hairy creature running through the tamarisks with ease. He told me that he could not understand how this creature could go through those trees without making any noise. I had no answer for him. That fall, after my son's sighting, my husband's brother wanted my youngest to travel down east through the river to meet up with him to hunt white-tailed deer. It was a thick, foggy morning, and I tried to convince my boy to stay home. It was the start of bow season, and he would not hear of missing out on a chance to get a whitetail. They left at 5 a.m., and I told him to listen and pay attention to his surroundings on the river. The fog was thick that day, and visibility would be low. Thirty minutes later, the front door flew open, and in walked my youngest son. He was upset, and I asked him what had happened. He told me that as he was walking through the fog, something was trailing him, or paralleling him, as he was moving through the river bottom. He decided to turn around and come back home. He didn't know what it was, but he could hear the heavy footfall through the leaves and brush. It was heavy. That boy had no fear of anything. I mean, anything. He would always say, if it bleeds, it can be killed. If he had other encounters when he was young, he never told me about it. When he was 20, he had an encounter that was face to face. My mom had signed the homestead over to me. I was the only one that cared about the place. We tore down the old two-story house and put a modular home in. As construction started on the place and ground was being broken, we would see these huge footprints that had walked all around the area. We started this project in November and there was snow on the ground, which made the tracks easy to see. I told my husband, who had never had an encounter, that this was proof that these creatures existed. After we moved in, everything was all right until the weather turned warmer. It was the summer of 2001 when my son had a face-to-face -face greeting with the Yeti. My youngest would always get up at 2.30 a.m. to relieve himself. Then he would go into the spare bedroom where I kept the blinds open and look down at the barn where the animals were kept, making sure that everything was okay. This was a habit with just about everyone in our family. As he approached the window, he could see a shadowy shape standing upright and flat against the outside wall of the barn. As he walked closer to the window, he became alarmed at what he was seeing. The creature turned and faced him through the window, and for several seconds, they just stared at each other. My son slowly backed up, ran to his room for his rifle. He was going to kill it, but when he returned, he had second thoughts. He wasn't sure of the target and elected to hold his fire. He later went back to bed and slept with his rifle. Three hours later, at 5.30 a.m., my son left for work. I got up a few minutes after he left, and at daybreak I started my chores after my husband left for work. I got down to the hay barn, and there was blood all over the hay, all over the ground. And the 10 cubic foot wheelbarrow I cleaned pens out with was full of blood. You could see where some animal had laid in the front of the wheelbarrow and bled into it. On the inside of my barn were deep gouges in the wood. They're still there today. I was astonished at what I was seeing. It was a bloodbath, like someone had been murdered in there. I checked my livestock, and they were all okay. My neighbor was outside, and I knew he would have heard something because he always keeps his bedroom window open at night. I walked across the road to explain what had happened and asked him if he had heard anything. He said he heard two shots that night, one on the bridge and one further up the road, and it happened at 2.55 a.m., when my son got home, he began telling me the story of what happened earlier that morning at the, at the spare bedroom window. All that happened at 2.35 a.m. Again, my neighbor heard the shots at 2.55 a.m. I then proceeded to tell my son what had happened at the hay barn and took him down to see the carnage. I believe one of these yetis were seen on the bridge and someone running the roads that night, probably a local rancher checking his animals, took a couple of shots at it, and obviously hit it. The beast made its way to our barn, gone inside, and bled all over everything, 
and then left or died and was taken away by others. We spent a long time looking for tracks around the barn, but we couldn't find anything. The only evidence we had was my son's sighting and the blood all over the interior of the barn. And then for a while, everything quieted down on the place. These events were not isolated encounters with just my family. There were five boys that lived on our road who ran around with my boys. All the kids spent a great deal of time in the river bottom. I began getting phone calls from their parents wanting to know about a huge hairy animal walking on two legs. I was hesitant to tell them about what I knew because I believed they would think I was crazy. I've lived there all my life, my neighbors had not, and this is why they looked to me for information. I avoided the topic, but later felt as if I needed to inform them. I felt like their safety was more important than what they thought of me. So I suggested that they instruct their kids to exit the river whenever they hear anything strange, or if the river bottom became very quiet. These creatures had scared the neighborhood boys, and I did my best to calm their fears. I did tell the boys of my experiences with these creatures, and I cautioned them to remember that these creatures are a living, breathing, unpredictable wild animal. I knew that a few of the boys had been in the woods and had been charged by Yeti. Those boys stayed out of the area for a while. My boys never quit running the river bottom, and I never stopped them either. They were hunters, and they knew that the river bottom got silent, that a huge predator was close, and they never went in there without a rifle. We all know when the river becomes deadly quiet, I mean so quiet that you could hear a pin drop, you better believe these creatures are there, and you better get out. My oldest son got married, had two boys of his own, and eventually moved to Montana. My youngest son got married and moved a mobile home on the place down by the pig barn, which was close to the edge of the river bottom. The creatures were not happy about that at all. There was something about that old pig barn. We never kept pigs there. That was something my father handled. There were no pigs on our property for a long time. But the ground where the pigs were kept were special to the creatures. While doing regular work in the ground, we found antique bottles and coins from a century or longer ago. Old Indian artifacts were uncovered there, as well as pieces of old pottery and other items. I believe something is buried there, and the Yeti hold it as sacred. That's the only explanation that makes any sense to me for them to be so protective over that small area of our land. What is buried there? I wouldn't know unless we tore the structure down and started excavating. I have even wondered if there's a First Nations people burial site deep in the ground. We may never know the significance of it. My wife and his new son didn't live in their new home long before strange things started happening. My youngest was a machinist and he worked nights. His wife was pregnant and worked during the day and got home when it was dark. She would come home and eventually be calling me and telling me something was rubbing on the side of the house. I would walk down with my 357 and my flashlight, but I never found anything. My son had told her about his experience and she knew about the beasts. I found it unusual that she was raised on the same river where we lived, but she was not familiar with the wildlife that lived in the area. Her parents forbid her and her siblings to play in the river bottoms at all, period. Her dad was raised on that river as well and was living on his family's homestead. I think he knows more than he will ever admit. Late one evening, my son heard human-like screaming coming from the river. He went outside to look, walking the pasture road with his forty-five. He heard the screams begin to get closer. Whatever it was, it was moving toward him and at a good pace. He turned and put several rounds into the river bottom, and that silenced the creatures. Later that week, they moved from their trailer to a vacant rental trailer we had on the property. They soon after sold their trailer and stayed in the rental further away from the river. She was pregnant, and he didn't want her dealing with these things in the woods. After the move, the creature stopped harassing the young couple, but it would not be long, though, before they started in on me again. One evening, while my husband was at work, I was up late watching TV, waiting on him to get home. I was sitting on the couch, and it was 11 p.m., and I heard a noise at my dining room window. It sounded like something was trying to get inside. I flew up out of that couch, called my son, got my 357 and my floodlight, and headed outside to see what in the world was trying to come in my window. To my surprise, my son was already there outside heading to the west side of the house. We both looked around and found nothing. At that time, I had a Queensland Blue Heeler and an Irish Wolfhound mix, and they were nowhere to be found. I went back in the house, and my son went home. 
and 15 minutes later, I heard the healer softly growling outside. The dogs had come home. I thought, oh my gosh, what now? And I picked up the pistol again and eased out the door. And there was my son leaning against a tree watching the area. A gentle breeze blew across his face as I walked down to talk to my son. Mom, these things are back, he said. Listen, you could hear it breaking brush and tearing up trees in the river bottom. He was right. You could hear it moving through the river woods. It was not trying to be stealthy. We stayed out there for 30 minutes listening, and apparently whatever had been close to the house had moved on. We both went back to our houses, and the rest of the night was quiet. I miss my son. He was a modern-day mountain man. I have never seen anyone with the unusual physical strength this young man had, and I had never known any man who had natural ability with a bow, a rifle, and a handgun. He was an exceptional tracker as well, and he never once crippled an animal while hunting. If he took a shot, the animal never suffered. He eventually opened his own gun shop. The business grew quickly, and it became popular within a year of opening. He did well with his business and with no formal education at all, but his passion for firearms and he poured himself into the business. He and his wife had two children, a boy and a girl. As they grew, my son would take them to the river to romp around. Those grandkids spent a lot of time with us. At the end of June in 2011, the grandkids and I were standing on the porch of my house when we started hearing some strange gibberish coming from the river bottom. My son and his wife were in their backyard working, I caught their attention in motion with my hand. Do you hear that? They nodded. My grandkids and I walked down to their house, and my son went inside and got a predator call. He walked to the pasture and started playing an animal in distress call. We stood there patiently watching the tree line 200 yards away at the back of the field. His wife asked why he hadn't brought his rifle, and his reply was that nothing was going to show up in the middle of the day. But he was wrong. Something showed up all right, a huge gray figure appeared, and it began to levitate five feet off the ground. It remained hovering for a minute, then it quickly spun away from us and darted back into the trees toward the river. My son yelled out, oh crap, and then sprinted into his house to get his rifle. We all waited for it to reappear, but it never did, leaving us standing in the field quite perplexed. The next week, my grandson went with me down to collect the trail cameras. His parents were at the gun shop and he was staying with me. We headed down to the mouth of the river and made it a short distance. When off to my left, through the tamarisks, I heard a loud rustling in the brush. I looked at my grandson and we saw this gray thing running through the trees. I was spooked a bit, but we continued to collect the trail cams. We brought them in, took a look at the pictures and found nothing of interest, and headed back to the river to put them back up, when we heard a deep growl. My grandson said, Nona, did you hear that? I said, yes, partner, I did, but just ignore it. It's the Yeti telling us we're too close to them. I told them that we would do our business and ignore them. When we came up out of the river, we headed for the house. He wanted to play outside down by the horse stalls, and I needed to do some yard work. A few minutes later, I heard him screaming, and I ran around the house. Nona, Nona, it came for me. The gray one came for me. When I got to him, he was describing what the creature looked like. It was big, Nona. It was gray, and it came up out of the river by the trees. I got him back to the house and left him there while I ran back to the barn with my pistol, a camera, and a measuring tape. There had to be tracks left by this one. I found a foot track and some loose dirt, and further up the hill, there was a clean handprint where the creature had hoisted itself over the top of a knoll. The foot impression was 15 inches long and 8 inches wide. With all this activity happening with my family, my grandchildren were at ease with all of this. They were like me. They didn't worry too much about it. They lived regular lives as kids usually do. Their father, on the other hand, had no patience with these things. He wanted to kill every one of them. Sometimes I think I should have let him. In 2011, I sent a summary of the events to several investigators who thought could help us. A team of two researchers responded and soon came to look around. We spent the day walking my property and talking about all the events since I was a child. I was surprised that they didn't want to stay the night and experience some of the activity we had talked about all that day, but they seemed to be in a hurry to get out of there before the sun went down. Brave investigators. <laughs> However, 
They left two trail cameras with me and showed me how to set them up. They recommended good spots to place the cameras, and they even showed me what to look for in the photos. And then the brave researchers left well before sundown. Through the years, I bought more trail cameras, and I've captured remarkable pictures of all sorts of things. Yetis are not the only cryptids that live in these woods. These creatures can communicate with us. I discovered this in the summer of 2018. I drove down to the river on my four-wheeler to cast a track that I had found that morning. My healer was with me. She was getting old, and she had moved slow that summer. I finished the cast, and my dog and I were about to head back when I noticed the woods around me got quiet again. No noise at all other than a gentle breeze blowing the leaves. Every hair on my body stood on end. I knew what this meant. I started the ATV and then began to pull away. I was urging my dog to speed it up a bit, when in my mind I was told, leave the area now. They were telling me that they were coming. Oh, that just flew all over me, and I stated in a clear voice so they could hear me that I would leave when I was damn good and ready. And that was exactly what I did. My dog and I took our own sweet time heading back to the house. This was the only time I had anything like that happen to me, and I know it sounds crazy, but I'm not crazy. It happened, and I will never forget it. I know when they're around, and there's no need to relay it to me telepathically. These things annoy me often. They will knock on my door at night or scratch on the windows to try to get me outside. I ignore them so long as they don't try and get in the house. If that ever happens, chaos will ensue for sure and guns will be blazing. In August of 2018, I saw something that shook me to my soul. My husband had just left for work and I decided to go outside to enjoy the beautiful morning. I stood on our porch soaking up the cool morning with my dogs at my side. It had been a hot summer and this day was no different. I glanced down by the mouth of the river and I saw a dogman standing in the middle of four elmwood trees grouped together. There was an opening between the trees and this thing was just standing there. Razor, my youngest dog, picked up the creature's scent and started growling, but she stayed with me. I stood there staring at it, thinking it must be the way the sun was creating a shadow. This had to be an illusion. It never moved. I checked the time on my watch and it was 6.30 a.m., I decided I would come out the next morning at the same time to see if it was indeed an illusion due to the sun's position. That afternoon, I went down to do chores and I took a tape measure so I could measure how tall this creature was, if there was actually a creature there at all. This thing would have stood nine feet tall and the width was four and a half feet wide. I know that dogmen existed. The stories of this creature had been around since I was a kid and there had been reports but it had always been on a back road on the other side of the river. I got up early the next morning and waited for 6.30 to roll around, and then I stepped outside. It was another beautiful day, just like the day before. To my surprise and horror, the opening between the trees was clear. I stood there, staring into those trees, thinking the creature might reappear. Thankfully, it did not. Its head was shaped like a Doberman. It was tall, wide, and thick. The beast I saw was a well-proportioned, muscular creature. Its head was rounded between pointed ears, its arms were long, and it was slender through the waist, but not too much like others have described. I couldn't see its eyes or its mouth, it was a hundred yards away, and my vision has deteriorated with age. Still today, I can't believe a dogman made itself known in broad daylight. I hope it stays away for sure, I know how hard it is to kill these creatures. I've seen their muscle mass now and their sheer strength. There's no way a human can run from them and get away. I will digress for a moment to share some information that I've gained from these experiences. Over 50 years of experiences while living with these creatures. If you have been charged or chased by any of these beings and believe that you got away without a severe incident taking place, like losing your life, I want you to rethink that. You got away because they let you go. If you don't have a strong faith in the Lord, consider yourself lucky you're still alive. I have lived with these things for a long time, and it is the Lord that has kept me and my family safe. Don't go hunting for these things. You're only borrowing trouble. You don't have to hunt them. I know them, understand their ways, and how they react to me and my family. I know what they can do to other animals and how they hunt. 
I've lost a few dogs in my time and wondered where those dogs went, but it became obvious what had happened to those dogs. Nothing comes from seeking these creatures out. Nothing. Being human makes us curious, and being curious can get you killed. Common sense must come into play when dealing with these anomalies. If what I read and listened to for the most part is truthful, then these creatures are having a hard time living with humans, and that only means that there will be more confrontations, and that means someone or something is going to get maimed or killed. You can have all the heavy armor you want when you go looking for these things, but if you don't understand what you're up against, a big rifle or pistol is not going to do you any good. God be with all those who look for these creatures. Okay, enough of my preaching, and on with more encounters. My first Irish wolfhound was a special animal. His name was Jake, and we had him for 15 years. He was a big dog. I'm five foot three, and Jake came up to my hip. He was highly intelligent, and he loved humans, and boy, could he fight. He was extra protective of my family and livestock, and he never cowered from a fight with the creatures that harassed our place. We also had a Queensland blue healer, whose name was Semi. In May of 2012, I came home from work to find both of these dogs with horrible lacerations just over one of their eyes. I brought them in the house and doctored their wounds and checked their bodies for others. Semi, the female, had swelling on the side of her head, and my guess is that her skull was fractured. I sat with them pondering on what could hurt them so badly. I believe they took after one of the creatures in the river bottom. Something had to have hit them with such force to fracture Semi's skull and split them open like that. The wounds were on the opposite eyes for each dog, leading me to believe that they attacked the creature from both sides at the same time. I also surmised that whatever hit them knocked them down and threw them into the raging river to drown them. They were soaking wet when I found them. It had been raining in the higher elevations and the river was raging. I don't know how these dogs got out of that raging water without drowning. They stuck around the house and never ventured toward the bottoms for a while. That convinced me that they had had a run-in with one of these many creatures that lurk on my place. Semi took three months to heal, and she had no mental problems that we ever noticed. All my dogs that I've had since an adult never showed any fear of these creatures, except my first two. They did not cower down, they became overly aggressive. I lost my dog Jake to cancer. It happened shortly after I lost my youngest son. When it rains, it pours. 2014 was a hard year for my family. My son passed away in October. We lost a little chihuahua in November, and Jake died in December. I was looking for another Irish wolfhound mix, and I found Razor, who's now five years old. He's pretty special and has taken on the same critters, nearly getting himself killed. He has the same courage Jake had, but he's not as big or tall, but he has a courageous heart. In June of 2016, I went down to do chores. Again, it was 4 a.m., and I headed down to feed the mare. I finished up and headed back to the barn to get feed for the dogs. The dog food is kept in a drum just inside the barn door. As I was scooping up the dog food, I heard a deep, low growl right inside the doorway. I was instantly afraid. I knew what that growl meant. I spun around, ready to take on whatever it was, and I noticed Razor patrolling the area. He had instantly come to my defense. I shined my light all over the place trying to get a fix on whatever was trying to have me for breakfast. I suppose the creature slipped away quickly and there was no further incident, but I was relieved to see Razor looking frantically to find the source of the growl. The whole thing scared me real bad and now the dogs are fed in the daylight when I come home from work in the afternoon. Razor and I have been through several encounters together. Again, it was early and I was headed to the barn to feed the mare. Razor took off towards the pasture to do his morning business, and I was taking the hay around to the barn to pitch it over the fence into the mare's manger. I heard Razor come unglued on the other side of the barn, snarling and growling like I've never heard him before. I instantly ran around the corner with my pitchfork in hand, and Razor was standing on his back legs, straight up with his nose in the air, trying to catch a scent. He was frantic and angry and ready for a fight. I walked to his side and he began to calm a bit. I paid attention to the air too with my nose, hoping to catch a scent. I never picked up anything, but Razor knew what was out there. I knew what was out there too, and I wasn't going to stay down there any longer. It took me a long time to calm my jitters once in the house. I told my husband what had happened, and he told me to start packing again when I do my chores. 
but the next morning, my husband took up my morning chores for me. He didn't want me getting hurt in the dark out there feeding the animals. My husband's a good man, but he's not much for talking unless he's pissed at me, and then he has a lot to say. Keep this story in your thoughts. It'll become important later. A few years ago, my husband and I were heading into town to get some lunch. We left our driveway and were crossing the single-lane bridge when I just happened to look east of the bridge into the river. In broad daylight, standing in front of the trunk of a giant elm tree, was a man-like being standing upright on two legs. His body was covered with hair, but I could see its tan-colored skin beneath the nose and the lower jaw protruding in an unnatural and in an abnormal position. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. As we drove across the bridge, I watched it stand there with its mouth hanging open and its arms outstretched. Its hands were big and I could see hair hanging past its fingertips. It was built like a freight train. It was a massive creature. We made it to the end of the bridge, but not before I noted a mark on the trunk of that elm level with its head. Later that day, I went down to measure its height against the elm trunk and my tape measure read eight feet. I don't know what that thing was, it didn't look like a Sasquatch or a dogman. The image of this thing was disturbing because of the sparse hair and its unnatural face. This sighting haunts me. There was something evil about that thing, and I don't want to run into him in the woods. A few paragraphs back, I told you about the creature growling at my feet while I was in the big barn getting dog food. Two of my show horses were attacked in the pasture next to the road that runs past our place. I went down to feed the animals and clean out the pens, but my horses were all over me. They wouldn't leave me alone. Believe me, this is strange behavior. Their stomachs always come first. I started examining them, and my mare had rake marks on either side of her hips and a huge rip on the front of her left shoulder. My gelding had been raked, clawed from under his chest, along his belly, all the way to his privates. These two horses were 18 months old. They stood over 16 hands tall and each weighed 1,200 pounds. The marks on the mare were from being pulled down across a T-post. The gelding appeared to have reared up to strike whatever was attacking them to defend himself and the mare and was raked by claws on his chest and belly. I took them to the vet and the mare needed stitches and I needed to see what I could do to help the gelding with his wounds. The vet told me the gelding was lucky that his guts weren't spilled. The rake marks were deep, and there was nothing the vet could do for the gelding, except to tell me that time will heal the wounds. He gave me an antibiotic spray to, to apply to the gelding's wounds, and sent me on my way. I was in a rage over what happened to my horses. I thought at first that it could have been a mountain lion, but I quickly dismissed this, because there isn't a mountain lion big enough to pull down a 1,200-pound horse down on a T-post. Even the vet said he didn't think it was a mountain lion. A big cat would jump on their backs and lunge for their throat or hind legs to latch onto it, but to physically grab them around the top of the hind quarters at that height of a horse would be impossible. After the incident, we moved the horses to the big pasture behind my house to allow them more room to get away in case of another attack. The gelding changed after that. If you walked across the pasture at dusk or at night, you would hear my gelding thundering across the field to take you out. He meant business and would forever be preemptive when dealing with the predator. Kids would come out of the river bottom in the pasture at night after a day of playing in there, and they were quickly run out by my gelding. By 2018, my mare and gelding were gone. They were fantastic horses and I missed them. I still have a little red dun mare, which is over 15 hands tall, and she weighs about 1,200 pounds. She's the only show horse, cutting horse, I have left. She's 21 years old now and have gone through quite a bit since she's been by herself. August of 2018, I went to do chores around 2.30 in the afternoon with Razor and Semi at my side. I pitched the mare some hay, took the wheelbarrow and bug spray and headed into her pen. Before cleaning the pen, I began to spray the mare down with bug spray. The mare spun around quickly and surprised me. I saw a huge muscled cat-like creature running on the pasture fence line closest to the river. This monster cat was 14 to 15 feet long. Its tail had to be 8 feet long. It all happened so quick that it seemed like a blur to me. However, I noticed that the color of the cat was wrong. It was a light fawn color on its sides, fading to a solid black down its back and tail. 
It was wide across the shoulders and through the back area. Its face was like a cat, but much bigger. Its head looked like the fur was clumped up all over its head, like you were looking at clumps of hair, but all over its face. I could not determine exactly what its face looked like, but this animal was enormous. It was gone as quickly as it had come. The dogs looked at me as if to say, what in the hell was that? The mare turned back around and began eating again. I stood there trying to wrap my mind around what I had just seen. I don't like big cats. Mountain lions will tear you up, not to mention they will eat you. They are wicked predators, and this cat thing was nothing short of mind-blowing. I stood there for over five minutes staring into the river bottom with a fear I had not had since I was an eight-year-old little girl. Big cats are nothing to fool with, and this one was beyond big. For days, I played over and over in my mind what I had seen that day. I believe that was the creature that growled at me when I was in the big barn getting food that night. A regular mountain lion does not like dogs, period, and tries to avoid them. This is one creature I would kill in a heartbeat because I know that it would try to kill me first. I don't need a big cat on my place of that size. A cat that big means it eats big, and I don't want to be on the menu. Why it let me see it is a mystery to me. Maybe to let me know that he did claim my area as its hunting ground. I really don't know. I've read and heard testimonies of these huge cats being in the southern part of the country, but not once did I expect to see one on my place. Of all the creatures I've seen or captured on video, this one gives me worry. If you can't hear it coming, which I didn't, and even if you have a gun, I still think you would become its next meal, because cats are cunning and stealthy. You would have to see this animal to understand why I feel this way. Do I believe this is the creature that attacked my mare and gelding? You bet I do. It had the weight, the length, and size to pull my mare down on a tea post. I'm grateful that my mare and gelding did not become this animal's next meal. Maybe it was looking to attack my red dun mare that day, but the dogs and I were there to prevent that. I have not seen this creature since, and I hope it has moved on. These days, I'm being watched. When I work on the ranch, the birds are singing and the river is alive with nature. But as soon as I throw the hay to the mare, everything starts to get quiet. Some of the birds in the river are squawking and throwing a fit because there's a predator around which stirs up my dogs. Razor has his nose in the air sniffing and Semi is on edge and alert. Every day this goes on. Even so, I grab the wheelbarrow and clean the pens. It's when I have to go behind the mare's barn and dump the manure that all my senses are on high alert. Everything is so quiet, but I go about my business. My dogs never leave me, and once I'm done dumping the waste, they leave the area with me. I know if these creatures wanted to kill me, they would have done it a long time ago. My point is, how can I have so many different species of cryptids on my place? Sometimes I regret putting out trail cameras because now I can't do without them. Knowing what I know now, there's no way that I'm going to take them down. I guess I have to come to grips with the fact that I have strange animals running up and down the river because no one has any answers for me. I've seen so much that my grandson said, Nona, how boring would your life be without these creatures? My only answer is that is boring would be nice. I love nature and all it entails but these are creatures that should not exist. It throws the balance off of nature, in my opinion. On December the 27th, 2018, my husband told me that I was missing a hen. He had looked in all the usual places for her, but had not seen her anywhere. It was 6 p.m. and almost dark, and with my spotlight, I started for the mouth of the river with razor and semi. The sun was long set in the west, and I was standing at the mouth of the river trying to shine my light in the tamarisks, looking for my hen. She is always the last one out of the river bottoms, and I thought just maybe she was hunkering down for the night in the brush. I shined my light to the left, and there was Razor pacing back and forth on the edge of the water with his nose in the air. Then I got nervous. It's a long way back to the house if something came barreling towards me. On top of that, I had just had knee surgery and couldn't run very well. I calmed myself, and I shined my light to the left. And at 60 yards or so, I saw a round ball of dark matter behind a young cottonwood tree. The tree was two feet around, and this dark matter stuck out two feet wider on both sides of the tree. 
I saw blue eye shine coming from the dark matter. This thing kept staring at me, and then it would duck its head and then look at me again. Finally, it dawned on me that I was looking at a baby Sasquatch. My blood ran cold because I knew its parents had to be close. Razor was still trying to get the scent of this thing as I spoke softly and told him to come on. We headed back to the house at a brisk walk. I put the dogs in and I told my husband what had happened. He thought that that was probably what got my chicken. I was none too pleased to hear that. The following Saturday, I had my grandson over. He's 11 years old. This young man is exactly like his father. He's already a good marksman and he can track animals. It was a cold, windy, and cloudy day. I needed to collect my trail cameras and put them back out. I was setting out number four of five cameras that I use and adjusting the angle of the shutter. I looked down the trail and I could see Razor acting strange, head raised, sniffing the air. Instantly, he lowered himself to the ground to make himself smaller. He looked over at me a few yards away and then looked back at whatever had spooked him. Slowly, Razor began to back up. This dog never backs away from anything. He had plenty of room to turn around and come to me, but he didn't. I went ahead and finished with the trail camera, and Razor finally ran over to me. The cold wind blew through those trees, and snow started falling in sheets. Something was way off. I could feel it. I yelled to my grandson to get out of here. He got the message, and he gunned his four-wheeler up the bank to the pasture. With the engine noise of his ATV fading, I sat there quietly and watched. I could hear something coming down the trail. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. My ATV roared to life and I was about to ascend the bank and I looked back down the trail. On both sides of the trail, the trees were bending erratically side to side. It was a windy day, but the wind we had that day did not make those trees do that. Something was bending them physically. For a moment, I saw something black blow past inside the trees. Those trees are 18 to 20 foot tall and whatever this thing was reached almost three quarters of the height of those trees. It was there and then gone in a split second. We both thought that this thing was going to pop out into the pasture at a different angle in a different spot, but it never did. Everything about that day was weird. The weather, the dogs, the feeling we both had while we were down there, nothing seemed right. Earlier in my story, I wrote that there was something much larger than a Bigfoot in these woods. They are something altogether different than Bigfoot or Dogman, and these things can cloak and blend in with their environment. While cloaked, they move through their trees making all sorts of noise, big logs breaking, brush being crushed down, and even trees snapping off or shaking like what we saw this day, and you would never see them do it. I've heard the Yeti walk through the river bottom. Yes, they are big and have a heavy footfall, but nothing, and I mean nothing, compares to what these things are. Once a Yeti tried to step over a hot wire fence in the pasture, and got zapped in his private parts. The scream that came out of that creature made your heart skip a few beats. I've heard the Yeti step into the river, and I can hear the water rushing around its feet, and then step out of the river, and then everything was quiet. This anomaly worries me. It worries me a lot. I can't see it, but I know that it's there. I believe the fallen angel creatures are to blame for all this nonsense. I believe that they might be the Nephilim, and that makes them dangerous. It would make sense that they would back off when you call upon the Lord. That means they absolutely know God is the power of this word. It also means that they are far more intelligent than people give them credit for. In recent months, black, unmarked helicopters have been flying all over my property. I don't know what they want or what they're doing. However, I have a suspicion they're in the military and they're doing livestock mutilations. Maybe it's a new weapon they're testing, and they're content to let the blame go to a UFO theory, but there's no way to know this for sure. Hovering over the grazing fields scares my horse, and it infuriates me and my husband. Apparently they saw me through the field with a rifle in my hand once. My husband also charged the helicopter at one point. They quickly left on both days. I think they were going to do something terrible to my horses. A lady in Black Forest, Colorado, caught a black hawk hovering over her cattle. She actually took shots at the chopper, and arrests were made, but I don't know what her case looked like after the arrest. She was smart because she called the sheriff and the newspaper. I'm sure they were threatening her, as they have many others. 
It was great that she busted them. She wasn't upset. She flat out said what they were doing. In my opinion, if you shoot one of these creatures or were attacked by one, call the sheriff's office and the local newspaper. I would call the newspaper first. I have a lot of respect for the lady in Black Forest. Most people would discredit all that I have stated here, and that's their right. I don't really care if you believe me or not, but I have the evidence of most of what I have written here. It's taken me years to write all this down or think about sending it all for someone to read. Call me crazy, but you would only have to spend a week or so on our place and your mind would be changed. How do you explain these researchers not staying out overnight? For me, I don't want anyone getting hurt, nor do I want to be responsible for someone getting hurt, killed, or disappearing. Do I think these things are part of Satan? I sure do. I've read the blogs about folks making statements about Bigfoot and how everyone should not harm them or shoot them because it's their territory. I own my place. I have to put up with these things on my place. They've killed my dogs, attacked my horses, and tried to take my grandson. Don't be such a bleeding heart. These creatures would do you in if given half the chance. Those who have never had an encounter and make comments like that really don't know what they're talking about, nor do they have much knowledge of wildlife in general. If you have ever hunted big game, then you know what I'm talking about. I've seen what normal wildlife can do to a human. What do you think these things would do if they got a hold of you? I know they bluff charge. I know they growl and scream to get you out of their area. I also know they're having a hard time with humans in general, thus the missing 411 cases. The Lord put the man to be ruler over all living things, not the other way around. I'm not saying don't shoot one. I'm saying you better know how to handle a gun out in the woods if all hell breaks loose, because going hand to hand with these creatures would be your demise. Headshots, my friend. Take headshots. If you can calm yourself down to even get a good shot off. All I write here is true, and I will continue to add to these pages as my encounters will continue. This place will be passed on to my youngest grandson because he loves this place as much as I do. My father's spirit lives here and he wants to be close to him. The place has to stay within the family because I believe if it were anyone else living here, they would be run off real quick. Good friends know of my encounters and have seen the proof for themselves, believe me. They won't venture out here after dark, and if they're here in the daytime, they leave way before nightfall. I laugh at them because they do get dramatic. Take the good Lord with you while in the woods, for you are always watched. I call them Watchers of the Woods. Take care, and God bless. A Bigfoot was visiting our daughter at night. We used to live out on US 50, east of Hillsborough, but west of Bainbridge. That's as close as I'm telling you where we were, because we sold the house to another family member who still lives there. And yes, we told them everything. I've read and heard a lot of stories around here and other places about how Bigfoot is attracted to kids. And lots of people say Bigfoot is harmless with kids. Might be. But that isn't how it is when it's your kid that a Bigfoot is attracted to. It's 2013, and we've been living here for a few years. It had previously been my parents' house and land, and they settled there when they were first married. Now at the time, it was me, my wife, and our two kids, a boy who was eight years old, and my little girl who was three. There were two bedrooms downstairs in that house. The upstairs, it's kind of like a Cape Cod, with one large open room that ran the length of the house with two small windows at either end and have sloping walls. We used this as our bedroom. We didn't have central air conditioning, but we did have window units, but we tried not to run them much if we didn't have to. They really shot our utility bill up high. It was May, and it was nice enough not to run the window units, but the upstairs was still pretty hot in the evening, and it was real muggy. So in between the times until it got hot enough for us to run the air conditioning unit, me and my wife would sleep on an air mattress in our eight-year-old son's room because it was a lot cooler down there and we got a good breeze through all the open windows. We chose that room because his room was bigger than our daughter's, who was only three years old. The hallway there was shaped into a T-shaped pattern with two bedroom doors facing each other at each end of the hallway and in between was a bathroom. 
so we could lay there on our air mattress and look down the short hallway into our girl's room, maybe ten or twelve feet away. She could have slept with us on the air mattress, and we offered, but she chose not to, which surprised us. The windows were open, and we were getting a good breeze, and soon we all went to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up needing to use the bathroom. Now, there were night lights in the hallway and in the bathroom, so I didn't have to turn on any lights, and I didn't want to because I might wake someone up. So I was standing there, and just as I started to do my business, I thought I heard talking. I thought my daughter had heard me get up. So when I finished, I washed my hands, then I stood quietly in the hallway to see if she had gone back to sleep. But I heard her clearly jabbering away again. Then I heard something else jabbering. I thought maybe there was a toy she was playing with that was making that noise. And just as quick, I knew she didn't have any toys that sounded like that. It was a different sound completely. Definitely not a toy, and it didn't quite sound human. Guttural is the only word I know, but the sound was fast and fluid. It was all nonsense, and I couldn't make any of it out, either hers or the other's replies. But whatever it was, it was talking really fast. The pitch was lower than a human, but I wouldn't say it was a deep or heavy voice or pitch. It sounded squawky and guttural all at once. I'm sorry, I don't have any words to describe it. Mostly, it just sounded wrong, and it scared me to death. I didn't even think beyond thinking someone was in the room with my daughter. I ran in and I flipped on the overhead light. I remember I was yelling something as I did so, and I woke the whole house up, and my daughter started crying. It was then, as I did all of that, and my eyes were scanning the room, that I saw something move away from the window, right after I flipped on the light. My daughter was sitting at the end of her bed by the open window. With the whole house up, I quickly handed my daughter to my wife. I got my shotgun and I went outside to confront someone but there was no one out there. Now, our house sits in the middle of nothing but fields. The nearest trees were probably close to a half mile away. If you stood on my back porch and you looked out that way, the trees looked about six inches tall on the horizon. That's how far they were, and you had to cross a whole other neighbor's fields to get to them. There was nowhere out there for someone to hide. I did think maybe they had run into the field and laid down somewhere that I couldn't see them in the dark. I checked the inside and outside of our pole barn that stood away from the house. If you were hiding, that would be the only place they could go, but there was nothing there. When I checked under my daughter's window, I could see that someone had smashed down all the ground cover that had been growing there. I can't say there was distinct footprints there, but all the plants were smashed flat. I finally went back inside and everyone settled down. I kept us all together in our son's room that night and for the next several nights. But I didn't sleep much none of those nights. I didn't call the sheriff that first night, mostly because when you live that far out, you learn you better know how to handle your own stuff. You can't be calling them out for every little thing, so I didn't. We tried talking to our daughter and asking who it was, but you know, it's hard to get anything sensible out of a three-year-old sometimes. She called him George, so we were really thinking maybe that was a man that had given her a bogus name just to make her comfortable so he could talk to her. We didn't really know what to think. A couple of weeks went by and nothing more happened, so I thought it was all done with and I thought some weirdos were just walking through the fields and maybe was checking out the house and my daughter just happened to be awake. All kinds of scenarios went through my mind and my wife's mind, but none of them really made sense. I can say we were not thinking of a Bigfoot. But by now it had become June, I think, and it was getting pretty warm, so we were running all the air units in the house. Me and my wife had put the kids down for bed and was in the living room watching TV when I saw my wife leaning her head toward the hallway like she was listening for something. I asked her what, and she quietly said she thought she heard my daughter in there and that she must not be asleep. That alarmed me, so I went into the hallway, and we had pulled her door about three-quarters of the way closed, but not all the way. I stood there in the dark hallway and looked through the couple of inches of doorway that were open. There was someone at her window again. I saw red and wanted to catch them this time, so I quietly backed up, went out, got my shotgun, and started out the front door. My wife was startled to see me get my shotgun, so I told her there was someone out there and I was going to get them, and I told her to be quiet. I went out the front door, hoping to catch them unaware and I came around the corner of the house real fast. 
and as I came around, I saw some movement going around the other far corner, just as I came around mine. So I ran down the side of the house to that corner and sighted down the back of the house. But there was nothing. I checked all around the house again, and again I checked inside and outside the barn. I walked rows of field, looking with the flashlight. I even checked the back of my truck that was parked by the house, and under all of the vehicles. I don't know where they went. Me and my wife were stumped. Worried that we might have a potential kidnapper around our house, I did make a report with the sheriff's office. They came out and saw what I did. All the trampling under the window and trails through the fields. For what it's worth, that deputy did really look pretty hard, and he took us seriously, and over the next few days, we did see their vehicles frequently driving by our house. After that, we kept all the kids with us that summer up in our bedroom on the second floor. And that's when things really started happening. We were laying there one night, and I wasn't quite asleep yet, when I felt a very strong vibration in the house. I didn't hear anything. We were laying right under the window air conditioner, which was on high, so that's about all I could hear, really. But I did feel that vibration. I came awake pretty fast when I felt it, and I leaned up, turned the air conditioner off, and sat there and listened. Then I heard the next couple of thumps, as well as felt them. I thought maybe someone was trying to bust into the house. So I woke up my wife, told her to call the sheriff's department. Then I headed down with my gun to defend my family and house, because I knew it would be some time before the deputy made it to my side of the county. I walked through the dark downstairs of the house, checked every room, and peeking out of every window. I turned off the air conditioner that was running in the living room so I could hear better. I heard another thump. I listened, and it sounded like it was coming from my girl's room down the hall. So I crept down the hallway and got up to the open door. I looked in, but there was no one there, and the windows weren't broken open, so I stood still and listened. Several more hard thumps hit the house. Now they were faster together, then they would just come one at a time, and then maybe several more all at once. I went over to the window, I stood at the side of it, and at the foot of the bed, and looked in between the gap of the blinds and the window. I didn't see anything there, but as I stood there, I felt a big thump and a vibration right about where I was standing next to the wall, maybe hip high. If I went out the back door, I thought, maybe I could see them from the back porch, since they seemed to be hitting both that wall and the wall with the other window on it around the corner. So I went through the back door, I still hadn't turned on any lights, so I grabbed the flashlight that we kept hanging by the back door. It must have heard me open the door. I stood on the back porch in darkness, but all the thumping had stopped. It was so quiet out there, my ears were ringing. I was starting to go down the porch steps to have a look when I saw a big freight train of something barrel away from that side of the house and across the fields. I raised the shotgun and held it against my hip while I flipped on the flashlight with my left hand. By the time I had done that, I knew a shot from my gun would not be effective. It had covered an incredible distance. So far, I couldn't touch it with my flashlight. And I knew what had run away from my house was inhuman. It just couldn't be human. It moved too fast. But I fired off the shell anyway, just as a warning not to come back. A few pellets may have hit it, but I don't think so. And it wouldn't have done any harm at that great distance anyway. By now, my wife was standing inside the back door and flipped on the porch light when she heard the shotgun. I knew she was scared. We all were by then. Yes, including me. I was scared at the thought of something, and not someone, being at my daughter's window. Someone I have no problem dealing with. A something is another matter. When the deputy got there, I told him everything, including that I didn't think it was a someone. I told him how fast it moved. We walked over to the area with flashlights, and we saw plenty of trampled soybean plants, but it was so dry there were no clear footprints. He made the report, and there wasn't much he could do or say. The way he was going over and over the exit path away from the house, I think he was suspicious that it might be something else, too. But I'm not sure. He didn't say anything. But from then on, me and my wife were in extreme watch guard mode. Now my boy knew something was going on, but we tried to keep as much from him as we could. Not only to protect him, but we also didn't want him talking about it around school. We kept the kids in our bedroom all the rest of that summer, really almost all the way to Christmas, which anyone with kids knows, that's not the best way to do it. Well, I didn't hear any more slaps around the house at night, 
There were a lot of times we had odd things happen. In the meantime, we gotten ourselves a dog, but there were times that he acted really strange. It would push itself between the recliner in the living room and the wall and would refuse to come out some nights. One night, my wife opened the can of dog food for him, put it out in the kitchen, but he wouldn't come near it. That wasn't like him. That dog was always hungry. He just stood in the back entry between the dining and kitchen area and would look across the kitchen at the food, but he would not put one paw in the kitchen toward it. Finally, my wife moved it closer to him, and he did eat it, but as long as he could stand in the dining room. I don't know why he did that. Just one night. It was really odd. I now wonder if maybe the Bigfoot wasn't somewhere outside out back, and that dog knew it. There was a time we found a big pile of rocks out on the back porch. They weren't all nicely stacked or in a particular form. It was just a big pile. But the weirdest thing we found was a pile of dead birds that had been left at my daughter's window. Yes, the window she had been talking to that thing from, and I don't know how long they'd been there. It was fall, and we were just outside doing some tidying up one weekend when we found them. From the looks of them, they'd been there for a while. I counted nine of them just in a loose pile. By now, our daughter had turned four. Sometimes she would talk about George, which is what she called it. We couldn't make heads or tails of it until one day. She was lying in the living room going through some of her favorite books. One of them was a curious George book, and she said she had missed George, and she was looking at the book. My wife and I looked at each other, and all the things I've been trying to look up and read about clicked. But we knew for sure the day my wife saw it. There's no garage or carport at that house, so our drive went up around the back of the house near the back porch. My wife was unloading groceries there one day from the car and was setting them on the back porch, then carrying them into the house. She said she had just loaded several bags on both arms and was getting ready to walk them over to the porch when her eyes landed on something dark and big out by the barn. She stopped and looked and watched it move to a squatting position near the corner of the barn. If she hadn't seen some kind of movement, she said she probably wouldn't have noticed it out there at all. Now, she had already let our daughter out of the car seat while she was unloading groceries because our daughter liked to pretend she was helping mummy. So my wife would usually give her one of the bags that she could put on the porch like she was a big girl who was really helping. My wife said she looked at that thing by the barn, got a little worried. She put my daughter in the house immediately, grabbed the few groceries that were left on the porch, and kept an eye on it out there. After she stood in the kitchen, looking out the window, trying to see what it was, eventually she said she watched it get up, walk across the front of the barn, then down the side of the barn, then turn and around the back of it until she couldn't see it anymore. But she said when she watched it walk across the front of the barn, that it was almost as high as our nine-foot barn doors. So she guesses eight, maybe eight feet and a quarter. That shocked her. She was not expecting that. And she also said it was dark in color, but she didn't think it was pure black. She couldn't tell if it was male or female or any kind of detail from that distance, but she said it definitely walked on two legs. I asked her a million questions, and I asked her to make sure it wasn't a bear. She said it was not possible to be a bear from what she saw. Well, that confirmed it all for me. Curious George, and what I read about the fascination with children that Bigfoot seems to have, how fast it seemed to move, suddenly everything made sense. I talked it over with my wife, for what it's worth. My wife is not a fanciful type. She doesn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster or aliens or anything of the sort. I can't say she even believes in Bigfoot, but she knows she saw something out there, and, there's no and there was no denying that something was going on around our house. So once she agreed with me, she agreed that we needed to move on. Then it was easy to keep the kids around us under our watch, but as every parent knows, that gets harder and harder as they get older. I mentioned it over the holidays to one of the young bucks in our family, my nephew to be exact, I said, we're thinking of renting the place out. He asked why, so I told him everything, but it didn't deter him at all. He said he wanted the place because it had been his grandparents' place before it was ours, and he had a lot of good memories there. So, on a handshake, we settled on it, and we rented to him starting the following spring. And he rented from us until he had enough money to outright buy it from us. 
Now he lives there alone, and he says that in all the years he's never been bothered, and I believe that's because he doesn't have kids. And I do think that is what has attracted that Bigfoot to our house. Maybe it saw our daughter one day while she was out playing. Maybe it was a female that had lost a young one and was drawn to her. I don't know, but I will say that I'm a lot happier now that my girl is older and has a bedroom that is right between ours and her brother's on the second floor of our current house. I asked her about George a while back. She has no memory of it, which relieved me and my wife. So that's it. That's what happened to us. My cousin Terry had become pretty interested in Bigfoot ever since his son said he had seen one near their home in Utah. This is the story of how I got involved in his so-called research, which turned out to be a bit more than either of us bargained for. My name is Seth, and you're probably going to think I'm lying because this story is so crazy. But I want you to know that after it all happened, I went to the nearest police station in Richfield and filed a report, something I've never done before. In my mind, it was serious enough that I thought they should know. And I also thought that it might save the next guy from being laughed at if they already had my report on file. They probably did laugh at me, but that's okay. While well, Terry's son Jared, my nephew, came running into their house one day, saying that he had seen a Bigfoot. They live near an old ranching community at the foot of the plateau. Terry just laughed, but when he realized that Jared was white as a sheet... He went out and investigated and found some tracks. They never saw the thing again, but this was the start of Terry's obsession, and I guess mine too. Terry started reading everything he could on the internet, and even talked around town to see if anyone else had seen one. He managed to hook up with a bow hunter who told him that he had been followed by a Bigfoot up on the plateau one time. Terry got the location, called me, and we decided to go for an outing up there and see what we could find. I didn't believe in Bigfoot, or I would have been too scared to go off looking for him. I thought it was kind of a big joke and something fun to do. I have a pickup with a camper on it, so I loaded it up with all of my gear and headed south for Terry's. I had a four-day weekend. I got to his place and we loaded up his gear, and then went grocery shopping and got some supplies. I thought for sure his son Jared would be coming along, but he wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, he had tried to talk his dad out of going. I guess his encounter really shook him up, and he had no intention of seeing another one. That kind of made me pause. What if these things were real? We were going to camp at the spot that Terry knew up in the aspen trees. It was near a place where rock hounds went up to look for nodules, a kind of sandstone ball that you can cut in two, and the interior has a beautiful pattern like a tree trunk. They're pretty rare, and this was one of the few places that they're found. So if we got bored, we could go and look for some, and maybe sell a few to the local rock shop. The road wound up and up along a gentle slope, and it wasn't long before we were up where we wanted to camp. It was a pretty little clearing in the aspens, with plenty of shade and grasses. There wasn't another soul anywhere to be seen. I pulled the truck around to where the camper door opened into the clearing, and then Terry unloaded his gear. He had a big cabin tent, and we set that up, complete with his cot, lantern, and everything else. There was a fire pit there from previous campers, so I set up the camp chairs by it and went and started gathering some wood while Terry finished up setting his camp. Man, that tent was nice. It was almost as big as my bedroom back home. It had nice, big screened-in windows that made it almost like being outdoors. He then put up a big mosquito net room that attached to the front of the tent. If the skeeters got bad, we could move our chairs in there. It was only mid-afternoon, so we decided to go look for nodules. We got our rock hammers out and headed up down the hill, where there was a big rock outcropping. We could see where people had dug into the cliffside, leaving small pits everywhere. We spent most of the afternoon messing around there, but finding only a few small nodules. It was now dusk and we decided to have some dinner. All that hard work made us hungry. Terry had brought steaks, so we put those on the grill over a small campfire. We pulled out some potato salad and stuff that we had bought earlier at the store. By the time everything was ready, it was fairly dark. I put some logs on the fire, and we pulled our chairs up close and ate. Before long, Terry was telling me some of the stories that he had read on the internet. He went on to describe what the typical Bigfoot looked like, and how it acted and all that. 
He then related a few encounters that he had read about in his general area. One where some people were harassed in their camp trailer, not too far from where we were currently. And another, way up the northern end of the plateau, where some hunters had been stalked. After a bit, I had to go relieve myself. I stepped away from the fire and into the darkness. I hadn't seen stars like that for many years. The whole sky was just hanging with them. But as I stood there, a spooky sense came over me, and I did all I could do to not panic, so I was soon back by the fire. In the meantime, Terry had decided it would be cool to do some wood knocking, and see if there was anything out there that would reply. He told me that this was how Bigfoot communicate their locations to each other. They knock on trees with big sticks of wood. By this time, I was pretty scared. By daylight, I didn't believe in Bigfoot. I mean, if they were real... Surely someone would come up with some real evidence. You know, the kind that you would take to a lab, a body, or something. But sitting out here, far from civilization, in the dark, they suddenly become a very real possibility. I didn't want to have anything to do with bringing them into our camp, and I told Terry that. I think he was surprised, but he seemed pretty spooked himself, and agreed it might not be so much fun to have these big guys around our camp in the dark. He joked that the smell of steaks had probably already informed them of our presence, and they'd be coming around soon without us having to do any wood knocking. I told him that I hoped not, and since he was the one in the tent, to let me know by the morning. By then, I was pretty tired, so I said goodnight and I climbed into the camper. He was going to sit by the fire a bit longer, and then he would put it out and go to bed himself. I crawled into bed and I laid there for a bit. I'm a bit claustrophobic, and I can't sleep up over the cab so I always used the dining area bed. As I laid there, I thought about the quiet. There's nothing like the quiet out in the wilds, or maybe I should say, all the stuff you don't hear. But then it finally dawned on me that this place had absolutely no night sounds of any kind, not even crickets, which usually seem to be everywhere. It was odd. I woke up sometime in the night and I tossed and I turned, not able to go back to sleep. I could see the fire out my little side window, and it was still going great guns. I could see Terry's form in the shadows cast by the fire. He was still sitting there. I looked at my watch, 11 p.m. I had climbed into the camper a mere hour ago, and I was tired, but why couldn't I sleep? And how long was he going to stay up? He would run out of wood soon, I thought, and then have to go to bed. I must have drifted off again, because when I next woke up, the light was streaming into the camper window. I laid there for a bit, and then got up and stuck my head out the door. Nobody around. Terry must be sleeping. I made some coffee, and then took it outside and sat by the now cold ashes of the fire ring. Before long, Terry was up and about, and I offered him some coffee. We both sat there and talked a bit about the previous night. He had sat up for a couple of hours, kind of afraid to put the fire out and go to bed, but he finally got so tired that he had no choice. We both kind of laughed about how scared we had been, and then we made some breakfast and decided to drive a few miles up to a small lake and do some fishing. We still had a couple of days before we had to go back, and we wanted to make the most of them. I can say that day was one of the finest days of my life. It was so quiet and peaceful up there, and just hanging around that little lake with nobody in sight except Terry. We were enjoying the beauty of nature, and it was really great. But then we drove back down to where the tent was, and that was the end of the peaceful feeling. Someone had stolen Terry's nice cabin tent. They had taken the whole thing, along with all of its contents. The cot, his sleeping bag, everything. That tent cost Terry a good sum, close to a thousand dollars, and it was a nice outfitter's tent. The other stuff, the camp chairs, our grill, a lantern, and a few odds and ends were all just as we'd left them. We had been at the lake all day, and it was now dusk, but we walked around, trying to see if we could make sense of anything, maybe find some boot tracks. Terry was over by where his tent had been, looking at the ground, when he whistled for me to come over. We both stood there and looked at the marks on the ground that led into the nearby aspens. It looked like someone had actually dragged the tent off, so we started following the drag marks. Whoever did it must have had help, because that tent was big and heavy, and it had all of Terry's camp gear inside of it. The marks went quite a ways from the clearing, way over onto the next hill. My god, Whatever dragged that tent that far must have been strong. We didn't see any tracks because of all the grass. But we finally found the tent, 
just when we were about to get ready to turn back because of the light failing. There it lay, in a heap, one side, completely torn off. Who was strong enough to rip heavy canvas apart like that? Terry's cot and gear were all still inside. We got what we could out and headed back. No way we were going to try to drag that tent back. It would take some doing, and it was almost dark. We made it back to camp, both of us looking over our shoulders the whole way. We were now beginning to realize that whatever had taken the tent was big and probably angry that we were there. We knew it wasn't a bear. They don't have hands to drag things like that. We didn't talk about what it could be, but I think we knew. By then we were starving, as we hadn't eaten since having some sandwiches at lunch. I immediately built a fire, but we hadn't collected more wood, and our supply was getting low. I got the rest of our steaks from my camper fridge and started cooking them on the stove in the camper. Terry was just sitting by the fire, clearly in shock. I went out and sat by him. We talked about what we should do. It was now dark. He could spend the night in the camper, sleeping up above the cab, and then we could go get the tent in the morning and see if it was salvageable. But in all honesty, I just wanted to leave. I knew he did too, but he was torn, as he didn't want to leave his expensive tent up there. I told him that we should leave and come back for it tomorrow, as it wasn't that far of a drive. We went inside and had dinner, not really sure what to do, but knowing what we wanted to do. Why didn't we leave? I don't know. We were both really tired, and our common sense wasn't working, I guess. And being inside the camper made things a little bit less scary. And then the topic came around as to what could have taken the tent, a subject that we had both kind of been avoiding. It was then that Terry started telling me about the little town of Marysvale, not that far away as the crow flies, over by a tourist trap called the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Near Marysvale is a canyon called Gorilla Canyon. He said the locals refused to go there and wouldn't talk about it. We're talking a bit of a ways from our camp, but not terribly far. To me, it was more evidence that these creatures were definitely in the area and that we should leave. Before long, the food kicked in, and we were both so tired that we were nodding off, so we went to bed. We would get up first thing, get the tent, and then leave. I slept like a log, until some time in the middle of the night when I woke up, thinking I was in an earthquake. The truck was rocking back and forth so hard, I thought it would tip over any second. I could barely get to my feet. Terry was trying to climb out of the overhead bed, and ended up falling pretty much on top of me. I started yelling at him that we should get out of the truck when all of a sudden, the action stopped. We regrouped, sitting on the bench bed, sure that we had been in an earthquake. We were a bit shocked, so I turned on the inside light. Shortly after, something slammed against the side of the truck, hard. It was like someone huge had slapped it with their open hand. And then I realized, this was no earthquake. And then, someone started fiddling with the door handle, trying to get it open. I had locked it before going to bed, but whoever it was, they were about to twist the handle clean off. I started yelling at them to get out of there, or I would shoot them. Of course, I didn't have a gun, but I thought it might deter them. Terry looked at me and just said calmly, I doubt they understand English. It was then that it really hit me what was out there, and I felt the blood rush to my head, and I was starting to get dizzy. The handle was straining under the force, and it would go any minute. What could we do? We could now hear a moaning sound, and it made my blood run cold. Terry was now cussing. I think he had more presence of mind than I did. I kept the pickup keys hanging on a little knob in the kitchen cupboard, and he grabbed them. I was now scared stiff, thinking that he was going to try to go out the door and get into the cab, but instead, he opened the little window in the camper that led to the cab and crawled through it. There was no way that I could follow him. I'm too big. I could hear the truck start, and then it jerked forward as Terry put it into first and took off. Everything in the back clanked and rolled around, as I still had the cooking stuff out and I hadn't battened down the hatches. I myself was nearly tossed off the bench seat. Now something slammed against the truck again, and I could hear the crunching sound of something big running alongside us, exactly next to where I was sitting. What I did next I will always regret, although in some ways I had to know. I leaned against the side of the camper, and I carefully pulled the curtain aside just enough so I could see out. It was dark enough that all I could make out was a dark form running beside us, having no trouble at all keeping up. 
although by now, Terry was really pushing it, bumping and careening down the narrow dirt road. This thing's shoulder was about equal to the window, and that meant it was huge. But now, I could see its giant arm grabbing onto the camper tie-down in the front corner, and it was now wrenching it off. If it managed to pull the camper off the truck, I was history, so I was now terrified. Terry had told me that Bigfoot was a gentle giant, yeah right. I could now feel the camper bouncing where that corner was no longer anchored. I started screaming at Terry to go faster, telling him it was trying to tear the camper off. He was already going dangerously too fast for the back road, and I knew if he lost control, that would be it for the both of us. If we didn't get hurt in the crash, who knows what the Bigfoot would do to us. I pulled the curtain back a little just once more to see what was going on though I could barely stay in my seat. Two glowing red eyes met mine, just inches away. It was looking inside, and it knew I was right there. I jumped, pulling the curtain back in place and diving for the floor, where I stayed the entire way back. Terry must have hit a flat stretch of road, because he was now really hauling, making good time. The Bigfoot slapped the side of the truck again. He was still right there. How could this thing run that fast? And now, I could feel the back tie-down being ripped away from the other side. I later realized that if the creature had torn off the back one on the same side as the front one, I wouldn't have made it back, as the camper would have tipped off when Terry took those curves so fast. I have never been so terrified in my life. I thought I was going to die. And it wasn't like thinking you're going to die in a close-call car wreck or something like that. The sheer terror made everything magnified a million times. I could never actually explain it. Words don't work. Terry was now going even faster, and then I heard the most chilling sound. The Bigfoot was now behind us, and it was screaming. The sound went on and on, and it still haunts my dreams. I can hear it right now. But it was falling behind, and I knew we had managed to escape. How Terry kept his wits enough to drive like that, I'll never know. It didn't take that long to get back to Terry's house. Maybe an hour. I just laid there on the floor the entire time. I felt the truck stop and the engine go quiet, but I just couldn't get up. Terry had to climb into the camper and help me to my feet. We both went inside the house, where I just laid there on the couch and then passed out. The next day, we assessed the damage to my truck. I had to get new tie-downs and have them installed by a local RV place, where I endured some teasing about going too fast on rough roads. They also had to patch the camper corners where the tie-downs had been ripped out, and this cost me some money as it took some major work to repair the holes. There were also a couple of dents where the creature had slammed my truck with its huge hands, and I just left those for later. I wasn't able to go home for a couple of days, but that was okay. I needed to stay there with Terry and rehash the whole thing. We talked about it over and over, until we had covered every possible detail and angle. We were both in shock. Terry's wife and son were fascinated by our story, and seemed to fully believe it. His wife is the one who encouraged us to go to the sheriff and report it. Who knows what they did with that information, but we thought maybe it would help if someone else ever saw it too. I finally went home, glad to be back in the city for the first time in my life. Terry's tent is still up there where the Bigfoot left it, the canvas probably rotting in the summer rains. A testament to forces much bigger and more mysterious than one could ever imagine. I'm sure someone eventually found our nodules. As far as I know, Terry never went Bigfoot hunting again. Growing up in Tennessee, I had the privilege of moving to a property that has been our family home since I was 13 years old. The location was nestled on a mountain just outside the National State Park, not too far from the famous Great Smoky Mountains. It was a small town with only around a thousand people. And with not much to do, I found solace in nature and the vast woods that surrounded us. Every day after school, my routine was simple. I'd come home, grab a knife, change my clothes, and head out to hike and explore the woods. As I grew older, my explorations took me further and further back, venturing out about a mile and a half from home. It was during one of these adventurous days when I made a startling discovery an old logging trail, and some land that had been strip mined. My curiosity led me to spend the whole day here, exploring, until the sun started to set. I was well aware of the sinkholes in the area, 
so I proceeded with caution. As I continued to explore, I stumbled upon the largest sinkhole I had ever seen. It spanned around 100 to 200 feet wide and was about 10 feet deep. Trees had fallen into it, giving it an eerie appearance. As I stood there observing, my eyes caught sight of something weird. A figure bent over towards the edge, about a hundred feet away from me. My heart skipped a beat as I tried to figure out what I was looking at. It was covered in dark gray hair and had a massive shoulder structure. At first I considered the possibility of it being a bear, but as I observed it from behind, I noticed a distinct difference in the head shape. It was like an elongated dome, resembling a large kitchen trash can lid. Ears were also visible on the side, not towards the top like a bear. Something was definitely not right. Slowly, I turned to leave, but as I did, this figure turned and looked straight at me. Fear washed over me as I took in its face, wrinkled and scarred, with dull gray skin tone. Its mouth had human-like teeth, while its flat and plump nose gave it an unsettling appearance. The creature's eyes were a dark green or black color, squinting at me before transforming into a snarling expression. In the blink of an eye, it stood up to a towering height of about eight feet, almost reaching the top of the sinkhole. My instincts kicked in, and I sprinted away in sheer terror. The creature pursued me, and all I could hear was its heavy footsteps pounding the ground behind me. I sought refuge in the thicket, hoping that it would make it harder for it to chase me. But this creature was relentless, running through the bushes while screaming a spine-chilling howl that was a strange mix of a donkey and a dog. I pushed my limits and I ran with all of my might, thinking that I might find safety near the barbed wire fence area where my uncle kept his cows and a bull. As I reached the fence, I propelled myself into a nearby tree, hoping to escape the creature's reach. My heart pounded and as I looked back, there it was, staring at me. A cow stood nearby and the creature shoved it to the ground before releasing another menacing howl directed straight at me. Its behavior sent shivers down my spine. It then turned and walked away, leaving me both relieved and bewildered. When I got home, I shared my experience with my brother, hoping he would understand the danger and stay out of the woods. But he dismissed it as a joke, assuming I was pulling his leg. Fearing ridicule, I decided to keep my encounter to myself all of these years. Since that day, I stay out of the woods, my heart still burdened by the memory of what I had encountered. I can't help but wonder what it was and what other mysteries the wilderness may hold. It reminds me to approach the great outdoors with caution and respect. My Uncle Ted was the sweetest guy you could ever meet. He really was my great uncle, but we just called him Uncle Ted. He was a retired minister, and he had spent most of his life helping people. Even after he retired, he helped everybody out. Sometimes it was financially, more often emotionally, or in dealing with problems. He was in his early 80s when my aunt died. They were always out and about, doing things, and now he became a complete homebody, we couldn't get him to go anywhere with us. But one day, while my mom and I were over visiting him, taking him some home-cooked food, my mom, who drives the van for the senior center and is always all over town picking people up, said that she'd heard from someone that there was a destitute old man living in the bushes out by the power plant. Some kids had seen his camp and it was a big mass of leaves and twigs, a big nest, and he had a bunch of string tied all over the trees and what looked like a couple of big walking sticks. No one had actually seen him, but once in a while, one of the kids would be riding their bikes by, and they would get an eerie weird feeling. One time, they got a quick glimpse of the guy. He was very tall and had silver hair. They knew he lived there, and he must be very poor. He was also in bad need of a shower, as the place smelled kind of rank. This was right up my uncle's alley. He had lost his will to live but all of a sudden, he became very interested in this vagabond guy. My uncle felt sorry for this lonely old guy, because he himself was also a lonely old guy. My uncle told me later that he had driven over there and scoped it all out, hoping to see this old man. I think it was the first time he'd mentioned going anywhere for many months. 
I was kind of worried, as I didn't know what was up, and I sure didn't want anything bad happening to my Uncle Ted. I talked to my mom about it, and then she talked to Uncle Ted and made him promise not to go over there alone again. I found out later that he continued going over there, but he took his little terrier dog after that so he wouldn't break his promise and be technically alone. He started going over there about every day, according to his neighbor, who I later talked to about it. She saw him leave every morning and head in that direction, so I assume that's what was going on. She actually asked him one day what was up, as she also wanted to keep an eye on him, as we all did. He told her he was going out for a drive each day, as it made him feel better. When she flat out asked him where he drove to, he said he always started over by the power plant, where he had begun taking a sack of groceries to the old homeless man every single day. Sometimes he even took him hot cups of tea, he told her. The cups would be returned each day to the drop-off spot, so he knew the guy was enjoying the hot drinks. Sometimes the old guy would leave him gifts, things like pretty rocks and carved sticks. The neighbor called my mom, and my mom lit into Uncle Ted, but in a nice way. She talked to him about being alone out there with a complete stranger, and did he have a clue what the old guy was all about? What if he came and knocked him on the head and stole his car or something? Uncle Ted just sat there sheepishly and said that if the guy wanted his car that bad, he could have it. My mom threw up her hands and fumed and fussed and ended it all by pleading with my uncle just to be very careful, and he assured her that he would. One blow after another, his little dog died of kidney failure. Now my uncle truly was alone, and he was very attached to that dog. We all worried about what effect this would have on him, and we tried to get him to adopt another, but he wouldn't. He said it wouldn't be fair to the dog to have an old guy like him as an owner, especially since he knew he was going to die soon. This really made my blood run cold. How could he know that? Was he suicidal? We intensified our contact with him. My dad now got involved and went over there every day to check on him, and my mom would call him every evening to talk for a while and try to cheer him up. We were always taking him baked goods and casseroles and things like that, but I was starting to suspect that they were going to the old homeless guy. One day after school, I rode my bike over to Uncle Ted's, as I did occasionally, just to say hello. I finally got up the nerve to ask him what he meant by what he had said. He told me that he had a bad heart, and he knew he was just going to keel over one of these days. He hadn't meant anything morbid by it, and he encouraged me not to worry, that death was a part of life, and he was ready. He then told me, but I know it won't be for a while. I want that old guy out there to reveal himself before I die. I want to talk to him and get to know him and see if I can help him out. Just like Uncle Ted, postponing his own death to help someone else. So, he kept going out there every morning, leaving food. I think he was becoming a bit obsessed with it. It had given his life the only meaning it seemed to have, and he craved that. He started going out there in the evenings, sometimes not coming home until well after dark. The neighbor spy reported back to my mom on all of this, and my mom was livid. She told him, It's bad enough for you to be hobnobbing with a complete stranger who very well could be a mental case. But for you to go out there at night is totally unacceptable. Don't you care that we worry about you? Of course he did, and he said he would stop coming home after dark. From now on, he would be home by late evening at the worst case. And he was true to his word, according to the neighbor spy. The days wore on, and the old guy refused to reveal himself to Uncle Ted, who had taken to leaving books and even a Bible. These disappeared, so he assumed the old guy was reading them. He also left a couple of L.L. Bean catalogs, with a note that indicated he would buy him whatever he needed, just to mark them and tell him the size. The old guy never did. All he seemed interested in was the food. Oh, and a sleeping bag that Uncle Ted left him, with a couple of pillows. Through all this, the old guy would leave presents, like the rocks and sticks. Uncle Ted then told me he didn't think the guy could read and write, and he sure wanted to help him. He started leaving pictures each day with simple words that associated with the picture. For example, he would leave a picture of an apple with the word apple written on it. He would leave the paper and the pen for the guy to use and hopefully write notes back, but he never did. But one day, Uncle Ted found a dead dove lying in the exchange spot. 
He was horrified and didn't know what to make of it, especially a dove, the symbol of peace and the Holy Spirit. So he left it. It disturbed him, thinking the old guy had killed it. My uncle refused the gift. He wasn't sure what effect this would have on their relationship, what there was of one. He actually didn't go back out there for a couple of days, but then he got worrying that the guy would be hungry. My mom found him and sent my dad to talk to him. He told Uncle Ted he wanted him to move in with us. And if he refused, we would make a case for his mental stability and force the issue. It was the only way my parents knew to safeguard this old guy. This upset Ted a lot, I know it did. Uncle Ted had now began leaving notes for the old guy. Dad found one in his car after it was all over, and it basically was begging the old guy to reveal himself so that they could talk. Uncle Ted said he knew he could help the guy find home and peace, if only he would reveal who he was and talk. This theme was repeated several times. One evening, about 8 p.m., my mom got a call from the neighbor spy. Uncle Ted's car wasn't home, and she hadn't seen him since early afternoon, so we had better come over. My parents went to his house, and there was no signs of anything, no problems. My mom called the police and sent them out to the old power plant. I think she knew something was terribly wrong and couldn't deal with finding my uncle herself. She was right. The police found him sitting in his car, hunched over the steering wheel, dead. On the windshield was a note, stuck in the wiper. Whoever wrote it had no idea what coherent handwriting was. It just looked like scribbling. Next to it was a shiny silver cross my uncle must have given the old guy. I knew the old guy had left it there, maybe after my uncle died. Maybe it was my imagination, but it seemed to have a sadness to it. The autopsy revealed that Uncle Ted had died of a heart attack. Later, after it was all said and done, my mom asked me what I thought had happened. I simply said, Mom, Uncle Ted finally had the revelation he had been wanting but I don't think he saw what he expected to see. She asked me what I meant, and I told her, I think what he was dealing with wasn't human at all, and when he realized that, it scared him, and he had a heart attack. She just nodded her head and started crying. Growing up in the state of Maine, I wouldn't consider it an uncommon question for people to ask me what there is to do here. For me, I always had a hobby of bird watching. I was part of a group and everything, and we would travel around to different parks and forests to try to see as many diverse birds as we could. One day, in the fall of 98, we ventured into the Acadia National Park for a trip we had spent months planning and saving money to get supplies for. There were about a dozen of us, but by the end of the first day, only about half decided to actually stay for more than a single night. When we first got there, we were looking into the sky almost constantly, trying to pick out different birds that we knew, and even a few that some of us didn't know. Of course, we were all equipped with binoculars to see the birds more clearly. We were on the cliff side at about 4 p.m., looking at the birds, looking through our books, and documenting. A shadow fell over us, which was strange, because the sky was clear, and it wasn't sunset yet. There was another cliff above ours, and when I looked up at it using my binoculars, I saw Bigfoot standing there. I'm sure he seemed bigger being above us, but I wanted to say he was maybe 15 or maybe even 20 feet tall. With the naked eye, it was hard seeing anything with the sun beaming on him. Through the binoculars, though, I got what might have been the clearest image of Bigfoot anyone has ever seen. He had thick gray hair covering most of his body. I could see the wrinkles on the palms of his hands that reminded me almost of an ape. His face, though, had characteristics so much like a human that it was strange. He had the same shaped nose as we did, and his ears that poked from the hair looked so much like a person's. The only major difference, I would say, is the mouth and the jaw of the beast standing above us. It was huge, and it looked strong enough that he probably could bite through bone. I waved at the rest of my group to get their attention, and soon we were all looking up at this creature, who seemed to not yet notice that we were under him. We were hoping that day to find some kind of rare bird, but instead, we found something that was debated to even exist. 
He seemed almost majestic, standing on the cliffside and overlooking some of the park. This place was his home, and he was letting himself stay hidden for the most part. When he looked down and saw all of these people looking at him through our binoculars, I could see actual fear in his eyes, and the shadow lifted off of us. He had taken off running, and we were all trying to get a good look at him leaving. No amount of looking at Bigfoot would have been enough, but all good things had to come to an end eventually. I did manage to see him as he was leaving, and I got a good look at his fabled large feet. They were the only part of him that had no hair at all, and again, seemed more human than I would have assumed. We would never catch up to him, so instead, we were stuck trying to explain to ourselves what we had just seen. We all knew exactly what happened, but saying it out loud to each other was hard. It took me about a week before I could actually say the sentence, I saw Bigfoot. I don't know if I'm happy to have this information, or wished that I could have lived in ignorant bliss like the people who didn't stick around. We cut the trip a day short because of what happened, and nothing being able to top it. The other strange thing I want to make note of is on the way back, we didn't see a single bird the entire time. I don't know if it was because of Bigfoot or something else, but I believe there was a connection. The bird watching would only be used as a distraction anyways to avoid talking about what we had all clearly seen. Finally, we had to try to admit that what we saw was something unexplainable. We never planned another camping trip in order to see birds, but we went to plenty other parks and even some day trails. Never again did I manage to come across the Bigfoot, but I think that's for the best. If I ever see him again, I don't think it will live up to the first time that I saw him on that cliffside, standing and looking like he ruled the entire world while remaining a secret. I don't want to alert too many people about the Bigfoot so people wouldn't go searching for him. He seemed pretty scared of humans, and it wouldn't feel right to try to send people in after him to get pictures and make a big tourist attraction. Instead, he is best staying there alone and only rarely showing himself to people like he did that day with my group. I still talk to a couple of those members and we still all agree that what we saw was Bigfoot and it was the craziest trip any of us had ever taken in our lives. My encounter happened back in the early 90s in British Columbia. I was camping out there for a week and I didn't expect to have a life-changing encounter with Bigfoot, but that's exactly what happened to me. I was born and raised in the area, and the legend of Bigfoot, even back then, was one of many that locals believed in. Many people would talk it among themselves in diners and other local hangouts, but it was very uncommon for them to discuss it at all with outsiders. If someone was visiting and they happened to ask about Bigfoot, which many people did, the locals would laugh and tell them it's nothing more than an old urban legend, Really, though, they all know the truth. I grew up in a household, with my father being an avid outdoorsman and a hunter. He used to come home and tell me and my siblings about the Sasquatch and how he would encounter them in the woods sometimes. He would tell us what I thought at the time were elaborate stories, about how they would take tomatoes right out of his hands and eat them whole, and how whenever he was in a certain spot in the woods by our house, he would bring them treats, and that's what would lure them out to come and visit with him. My dad, to this day, insists those stories are true, and though I wasn't there, I have believed in those stories so much more since having my own personal encounter with the creature. But while my father's story were endearing, and made me think that the Bigfoot are all peaceful and fun-loving, playful creatures, my experience was very different, and it terrified me like nothing else I had ever encountered before or since. The ones my father would describe had brown hair, and the one that I saw was black and gray all over. I don't know if the color of the fur makes any difference, but if my dad is to be believed, then maybe it does. I was moving my camp every other night to cover more ground. I wasn't out there for any specific reason, other than to explore a new area where I hadn't been before. I always kept my dad's stories in the back of my mind, and I wonder if somehow I manifested my own encounter with Bigfoot, because I had spent so much time thinking about it. Granted, I've not seen it since that time, and I still think about it often. I see all these encounter stories online, and it's really anyone's guess what Bigfoot's general temperament is, because the encounter stories have a wide range between peace, love, and harmony, and aggression, terror, and rage. 
It was my third night out there, and the weather was pretty fair and warm. I set up my camp in the middle of nowhere, and it had been a whole day since I had seen another human being or another camp. I was perfectly okay with being there by myself, and these camping excursions were something I did all the time. I had some food, and I sat by the fire for a while, before getting comfortable in my sleeping bag and dozing off for the night at around 11 o'clock. I woke up two hours later to horrific howling and wailing echoing all around me in the woods. I was terrified immediately because all the noise had shocked me awake. For someone who had been spending the nights in the woods as often as possible over the course of my entire life at that point, to wake up hearing those awful sounds was more than just startling. I grabbed my gun, which I always had next to me, and I just sat there with the bottom half of my body still inside my sleeping bag, and I listened intently for whatever it was to make more noise. I thought, if I heard it again, I would be able to tell a little better where it was coming from, now that I was awake. It happened again almost immediately, and the wailing and howling sound sounded like half-human, half-animal, which added even more strangeness into the mix. It also didn't help that the sounds were coming from different parts of the woods around me, meaning... There was more than one of them. Of course, and much to my annoyance, I had just woken up after sleeping soundly for a couple of hours, and therefore, I had to go to the bathroom. I went, and I did that, and as I walked back in the dark, I thought I heard something shuffling around, near where my sleeping bag was. I turned on the flashlight that was in my pocket, and I made the mistake of shining it right at the sleeping bags. I guess I wasn't thinking too clearly, and it was a grave mistake that could have ended up being deadly for me. I immediately saw four massive, hulking figures standing around my camp, and all of them looked at first glance like gorillas. I knew that there were no gorillas out there with me, but my eyes just weren't registering what I was watching. Even if I had considered them to be Bigfoot creatures, I didn't know that there were ones with black fur like that. They all turned to look at me at the exact same time, and I immediately lowered my flashlight. I didn't turn it off, but I aimed it at the ground in front of me. By that time, I was ducked behind a tree and peeking out around it to get a closer look at the four giant, hairy creatures, who seemed at the moment to be very interested in my sleeping bag, my pillow, and my gun. They stopped chattering to one another when I shone the light back on them, but once I lowered the light, they went right back to it. They seemed to be communicating to one another through a series of grunts and clicks or something. I obviously didn't know what they were saying, but it didn't matter. I knew I was in trouble and that I didn't stand a chance, especially without my gun. They were all between 10 and 12 feet tall, with each one half as wide as it was tall. The arms were extremely long, and their huge hands hung down past their knees. The quick glance that I saw of them anyways looked like some sort of primate and human mix. I knew there was nowhere for me to go. I think they knew it too, because they didn't seem too concerned about the fact that I was there. It was bright enough from the moonlight for me to be able to see what they were doing, albeit not very clearly. I still didn't want to risk making them angry by shining the light on them again. It was just as I was thinking about what my next move would be, that something growled from behind me. I froze, and my heart skipped a beat. I knew it was one of the creatures before I even turned around to see it. I slowly turned around with my hands in the air, and there was another one of the exact same creatures standing there. The only difference was that this one was much smaller, and that it was on all fours. I was shaking so badly, and I could hardly stand, and it started jumping up and down and alerting the others, just in case they didn't already know I was there. It then gave me a look, I swear, was one of disgust, and walked around me to join the others. I turned around so I wouldn't have my back turned to them. There were five of them now, and I thought for sure I was dead. I looked, and I saw them examining my things, before they finally all turned and walked off together back into the woods. I didn't move for a few minutes, but then I went back to the camp. I figured I would stay up all night long, and once the sun rose, I would get out of there and never go back. I sat on top of the sleeping bag with my gun in my hand, but I did eventually fall back asleep again. I woke up again to being pulled by my ankles. I panicked, and I tried to kick at whatever had me, but it was too strong. I knew without even looking that it was one of the creatures from earlier. 
I didn't open my eyes right away, and I just listened. I heard the same chattering, and it was coming from at least three of them. My ankles eventually dropped, and I heard the gun go off. I swear, I thought I had been mistaken all along, but maybe it was a human being who had grabbed and dragged me off, and whoever it was had just shot me. I opened my eyes and I closed them again quickly when I saw three of the black Bigfoot creatures once again looking through my stuff. The way I saw it was what if they thought I was dead? Maybe they would leave me alone and not kill me. They were extremely loud and exited once the gun went off and they sounded more ape-like than anything else after that. The ground vibrated as they jumped up and down and as I squinted my eyes to try to see a little bit of what was going on, I saw one of them looking very angry and pounding its chest at the one who was holding my gun. I heard some more shuffling and then I felt something touching my nose. I didn't dare open my eyes and I heard a loud sniffing noise as though one or all of them were smelling me. I squinted again, praying that it didn't notice, and I saw I was face to face, literally nose to nose with the biggest one of them. And then it howled and the others wailed and then I heard more shuffling and then they retreated into the woods. I opened my eyes after about 10 minutes of lying there, seeing if they were going to come back again or not, but they didn't. I got up, carefully, and saw that they had taken literally everything from me. They took my gun, sleeping bag, pillow, and my entire backpack full of food. They even took my sneakers, which I hadn't been wearing because all of this started while I was sleeping. I waited until the sun came up an hour later, and I made my way barefoot out of there. I immediately called my dad when I got home, and I told him what happened to me, but he didn't really believe me, I could tell. However, he offered to go back out there with me whenever I was ready to do so. He wanted to prove to me that whatever had terrorized me that night hadn't been Bigfoot creatures at all, because in his mind, they were very friendly and loving beings. I eventually took him up on the offer, although it took me a while to gather the courage to go out there again. And eventually, after a few trips, we ran into them again. The encounter I had when I was out there with my father wasn't anywhere near as severe as the one I had when I was out there by myself, but it was still terrifying. I think just seeing one of them again was enough to scare me. My dad wasn't convinced because he only saw it that time. It didn't approach us or bother us in any way. I think that's because it was alone, and when I had my initial encounter, there was five of them. I've been back out there many times and have had several encounters and I have even gone with my father to his favorite Bigfoot spot and I saw some of the brown ones he used to interact with. There's such a big difference, it's hard to believe that they could even remotely be related, but I guess that's with humans too. That's all for this encounter, but I have plenty more I plan on writing out and sending in. Thanks for letting me get this out there. I wanted to tell you about my experience concerning Bigfoot. I was a police officer at the time, now retired. I did not see one, but what I heard was unreal. I have been hiking, backpacking all of my life, and I know how to track and I know pretty much all the animals in the forest. My partner, another police officer, and his son were with me hiking deep in the mountains of Kern County in California. We were there for three days, 20 miles in, where few go. We were not on any known typical trails, just made our own and were having fun. The first night, around 9pm, my buddy and I noticed everything was completely quiet. Minutes before, there were animal sounds, insects, your typical outdoor chatter. All of a sudden, it was completely quiet. And then we hear this scream yell that seemed to have such a tremendous power that we could feel the vibrations through us. I have never heard or felt anything like that ever. We grabbed our handguns and continued listening. It seemed to be about two to five miles away from what we could tell, and we knew the exact direction. Whatever this was, it had some huge lungs and power, because there is no way any human can yell for that long without taking a breath to start again. This scream howl lasted almost a minute, and we timed it between yellings. It was very eerie, and I will say the hair on my neck stood up, and we were actually somewhat scared. When we go backpacking and camping, we do it for fun, to enjoy nature, and just love the outdoors. I was aware of Sasquatch, and I personally believed it existed, but I never really thought about it when I was out in the outdoors. 
This yelling scream continued for about 45 minutes over and over, and it sounded angry. Later that night, about 12 a.m., we heard something near our camp. We had a big fire burning on purpose, and some larger thick branches also, in case we had to use them and light them as torches. We still had our guns ready, though. I don't advocate killing a Bigfoot, but I will defend myself. We never saw anything, and it was too dark and dangerous to go exploring in the dark. We shined our flashlights, and we have powerful lights that we use at work. We still did not see anything, but it would get quiet when we used our flashlight to spot the area that we would hear walking rustling noises. Then we would turn the lights off, and we would hear something walking around again. Finally, we walked close with lights and guns to investigate, and something ran off, and we could hear branches just breaking. So we stopped and went back to our camp area near our fire. We did not sleep all night and decided to leave on the second day because my friend's kid was really scared. Now after that night, we all felt that we were being watched. We looked around and found the area where something large was walking the night before. We did find some large foot impressions, but not too visible. But branches, even large branches on trees were broken. The highest were seven feet up and you could clearly see a broken pathway. We followed it until the forest area came to a clearing with no trees. No more footprints, as the ground was hard there. But we felt more uncomfortable, and we turned around back to camp. As we gathered up our gear and backpacks, we still had that feeling of being watched. Two miles from camp, we were hiking back about 20 miles to my friend's truck, and we felt that we were being followed. At times, we would yell out, saying, Who's there? We are well armed. No response. After about three miles or so, that feeling of being watched and followed was gone. Strange as all three of us felt that same feeling at that same time. I will say this. We kept watching our backs and all areas till we made it back to my friend's truck. I will admit that this experience made us think and we were all scared. Just having our handguns was not enough in our opinion. We were armed, as we feel we are deep in the mountains, with no 911. Cell phones would not work there, and you never know. We would figure, anything from an animal attack or criminals in the mountains, that we would defend ourselves. We went back to work and told our partners what happened, and of course, most were laughing, saying Bigfoot and more jokes. I don't mind the jokes, and we were laughing too. Well, two years goes by, and I really did not go on YouTube like I do now. A friend sent me a video from YouTube with recordings of Bigfoot in different states. I listened to five recordings, and yes, they were strange and eerie. Well, on the fifth recording from another state were the exact screams that we had heard. It was so exact that while at work, my hair on my neck stood up again, like I was back in those mountains. My buddy, who experienced this with me, was just walking into the station and heard the scream, and his face was priceless. But he actually shook and said, that's what we heard when I told them it was a recorded Bigfoot scream. I can tell you this, my fellow police partners know my buddy and I are not jokesters and honest. When we play that recording to our dispatchers, police, and other civilians, no one was laughing. Even some of the non-believers said it was spooky and some said they didn't want anything to do with the outdoors. This is my story. I like to say that my Bigfoot experience happened at Zion National Park, when in reality, it actually took place at a camping ground outside of the park. I was going cross-country with my wife and two kids and staying in an RV. We had just explored some of the park during the day, and settled nearby at an RV campground for the night. Around us were a ton of signs regarding wildlife, not to leave food around, not to harass or hunt the animals. Not a single one of those signs mentioned the fact that Bigfoot lived in the area, and would come down to the campsite at any time. Even if there was a sign for Bigfoot, I would have assumed it was a joke, but the thing I saw that night at the camp was no joke. It was busy, being the summer with a lot of RVs parked for the night. My family liked to go to bed early, but I have insomnia, and sleep is not something that comes easy for me. It was a bad night, so I went outside of the RV to not disturb my family. I'm also friendly and tend to get along with people. 
That was how I found myself sitting around with another guy who offered me a beer and to hang out for a while. One good thing about traveling is meeting all of these friendly people along the way. We had a fun time, but after about an hour, it was 1am, and he went in for the night to sleep. I still knew that I wouldn't be able to, and instead, just started wandering around, looking for something to entertain myself. This was 2005, so not everyone had a smartphone yet, and we decided on no internet for the trip because it was family time. This left me bored and trying to walk around to make myself tired. Instead, I saw a huge creature, a couple of rows down, and without thinking, I started to go after it. I got one RV away, and I could clearly see that I wasn't looking at some person trying to rob RVs while people slept. I was looking at Bigfoot as he wandered around to see what people had left out. I wouldn't have pegged him as a scavenger, but there he was, grabbing food scraps off the ground and putting them right into his mouth. Every time he found something, he would make a little noise, like a happy grunt. I couldn't believe what I was looking at, and the fact everyone else was inside and asleep, missing it. I wanted to get something that I could prove to people that Bigfoot was actually there. He had a ton of fur hanging off his body, and I figured I could just cut a little piece off with my pocket knife. He wouldn't even feel it, and then I would have proof of him existing and being right there. I went slowly, because when I saw him eating, I also got a nice glimpse of how big his teeth were. If I was going to name a creature, it would probably be about the most dangerous part of his body. Instead of Bigfoot, I would have named him Big Tooth or something like that. It was quiet, so when I took one more step forward with my knife in my hand, he saw me, and he did not look happy. And I swear, he understood what the knife was. He didn't understand what I was going to use it for, though, because he got angry and actually tried to grab it into the air from me. I jumped out of the way and started to sprint back to my RV. Luckily, I could fit between tight spots easily, while he would have to take the longer way around. I ran full speed into my RV, and I started looking out the windows to see if I lost him. All I noticed was a bit of a shadow moving, but I didn't actually see again the beast that it belonged to. With me running in and slamming the door, I woke up my wife, who started freaking out, thinking that something terrible had happened. I tried to tell her that it did, and that I was just attacked by a Bigfoot. She could smell the beer on me, and instead of trusting me, she started yelling at me for being drunk in the middle of the night. She also forbade me from trying to tell my kids this story because it might scare them. I was kind of angry that she didn't believe me, even though I had so much detail in my story to tell her. Being drunk can do a lot of things, but a single beer can never make me hallucinate an entire run-in with Bigfoot himself. The next morning, I was going to prove it because he must have left some kind of mess or damage in his wake. Outside of the RV in the morning, people could see a huge mess of food wrappers being left and dirt being dug up. I wanted to tell them exactly what did it, but one look from my wife made me stop right in my tracks. People started blaming raccoons, and the owners of the park told people that complained it was their fault for not cleaning up properly. Before we left, I did manage to go to the owner and ask him if people have ever talked about seeing Bigfoot in the area. He just smiled and shook his head at me as if I was joking or something. My real guess is that he knew Bigfoot was living around there and just didn't want to say anything to tip people off or scare them. I have gone on some great trips in my days, but nothing compares to this one where I managed to run into Bigfoot and live to tell the tale. I hope that by documenting this, at least one person out there will know what I'm talking about and maybe have seen him around there too. It was the early 90s, and I was living my dream and traveling across the United States in a camper van, spending as much time as I could in the wilderness. There was nothing negative going on in my life at the time, and I wasn't depressed or trying to outrun my problems or anything like that. It's just I had always wanted to go across the country in a camper and make a stop in every state. I finally had enough money saved to be able to do those things comfortably, so I headed on my way. I live on the West Coast, and so I started there and took the most zigzagged route to be able to make a stop in every single state. I had only regular maps because it was too early a time for even MapQuest, and I was really looking forward to getting out there and seeing more of America. I spent an entire year planning out this trip, so I knew exactly where I would be stopping in each state, 
and there shouldn't have been any surprises. What I didn't account for were the strange creatures I would come across, and the sometimes very terrifying encounters I would have with them. The first one was a Bigfoot, as we know them to be today, and it just got more and more strange from then on out. I wanted to start with my first experience, but I will say that out of the 50 states I visited at the time, I encountered something strange in the woods in 40 of them, and out of those 40, 30 of them were terrifying or sinister in some way. We live in a very strange world, but I think it wasn't until very recently that we were willing to accept that fact, and back then, when I was traveling, it hadn't even entered my mind that I would be coming across evil entities, spirits of the dead, or Bigfoot itself. It happened in New York State, in the middle of my journey cross-country and back home. I had some bizarre experiences in some of the states before this one in New York, but I had most of them after this one, on the way back. I've thought about that a lot because for the most part, with some exceptions but not many, I stayed in all the same places both times I traveled through a state, if I had to travel through twice. I was only in New York once, and that was enough for me. I think that once my mind had been opened to the fact of something like Bigfoot is real, it opened me up to a whole wide range of things that I never even considered. It was almost 7 in the evening when I finally arrived at the campsite and I was tired after a long day on the road. I was hungry, and I needed a shower. I took a shower, and then I went outside to light a fire. I just wanted to get some reading done, and do some more planning for the route back towards home to ensure that I didn't miss anything exciting in the eastern states. I was deciding if I wanted to go to the beaches in New Jersey or not, things like that. Just mapping it all out, I guess you could say. Suddenly, I got the feeling that something was watching me from the darkness of the woods all around me. I had only seen a few people on the drive-in, but they were miles back down at the trail. I hadn't seen any other camper vans or other humans near where I decided to park for the night. My camper had a traditional setup, and the same one you will find in most of them today, so it should be easy to picture what I am about to tell you in your head. My eyes were becoming very tired, but I was also hungry, and decided to take out my portable grill and barbecue some steaks and vegetables. I made two for myself, two baked potatoes, and some vegetables. I was planning on staying there for two more nights because it was so peaceful, and I needed a break from driving. Then I had finally decided that I did want to go and visit the ocean, and I would stay in a hotel for that. I had everything set up and was cooking. The food smelled so good, and the fact that I was starving helped it to smell even better. When I decided to put on some music, it was late at that point, but I knew no one else was around. Who was going to complain? So I played it at a reasonably loud level, but I didn't blast it or anything. I only had some mixtapes and an FM radio. I was playing some good old-fashioned rock and roll when I started to again feel like I was being watched. It was to the point that it gave me the creeps, and I was starting to become uncomfortable. I like my steaks medium well though, and so I had to keep on trucking through to at least finish cooking my meal. I decided to eat it inside because the feeling of being watched had become so intense. I wondered if it was maybe a human being, perhaps a transient, who smelled the food and was waiting for the right moment to pounce on me and take it. I had run into that same problem in Alabama and another state in the area of the country on the same trip, so it wasn't out of the question or unreasonable for me to have been thinking that. I grabbed my flashlight and walked past the fire and did a lap, checking the whole perimeter of the area where I was parked. I didn't see anything, but I did notice a disgusting and very overwhelming stench coming from somewhere. It was making me gag, and it smelled like rotten food and a wet dog. I couldn't imagine what it could have been, but I tried my best to get the food cooked and get inside. I heard some grunting sounds that were loud enough to go over the music, so I turned the music off and I listened. I called out and told whoever was out there that I didn't want any trouble but that I was armed and had no intention of sharing my food with anyone. I told them to get lost and go find someone else to harass. No one responded, of course, but I heard hollering echoing throughout the forest that sounded like it was coming from more places than one. Whatever was out there, they were huge and loud, and I could tell that just by how they sounded. Something else I thought when I heard how loud they were was that they were angry, and so I was very relieved when my steaks and the other food were finally done, so I grabbed everything and went inside. 
I laid it on a little table and went back outside to put out the fire. I have often wondered so often if I had left that fire going, if what had happened to me would have happened or not. But of course, there's no real way of knowing. I dimmed the lights a little bit and I sat down to eat while I read a book. I had just taken my first bite of my steak and when suddenly the entire camper started violently shaking and rocking back and forth. I immediately jumped up, just out of instinct, and I tried to steady myself so that I could check the windows and see who was shaking it. I immediately fell though. It was that violently rocking, and I felt like there were several people on both sides. I mean, in all reality, there had to have been more than a few people involved, because it was a huge camper van with my 250-pound self and all my belongings inside of it, not to mention the furniture. I was scared right away because I thought for sure that whoever was out there planned on running me out the door to see what was happening and then I was going to get shot or something. I had the whole scenario played out in my head repeatedly. I yelled for it to stop because I couldn't do anything but crawl around. I kept trying to stand back up, but it was impossible. Finally, at around the fourth or fifth time I screamed for them to stop, they did, and everything was completely still again. In fact, Everything outside the camper was a bit too still for my liking. I couldn't hear any of the incessant chirping of the crickets, which had been bothering me not only while I was outside cooking, but after I had gone inside to eat and read as well. They were suddenly silent, every single one of them, and no noise was coming out of the forest surrounding me at all. That was, I think, more terrifying than anything that had happened up until that point. I stood up as quickly as possible, and I was making my way over to the window to see what was going on, when suddenly I heard loud banging and knocking coming from all sides of the vehicle. I made my way to the front and removed the large screen. It was a piece of thick cardboard that fit right into the windshield on the dashboard. I didn't see anything there, and the knocking continued. There was no way I was opening the door, so I went back and I looked out the window. I was face to chest with a hairy, bipedal creature. It was so tall, its face was not even with the window, which was several feet off the ground. If I had to guess, I would say it was approximately seven feet up from the top of the window to the ground, and all I could see was the chest and neck of whatever this beast was. I banged on the window from the inside, and that's when it leaned in to look at me, and we made direct eye contact. I also noticed it had started to pour outside, but I couldn't think of anything else, like why I hadn't heard the rain in the first place because I was looking into large green eyes. This thing looked angry and immediately roared at me and started pounding on its chest, looking all around while hollering and yelling loudly. Suddenly the banging and shaking stopped, and two more of the same creatures came and approached the one I was facing off with. I kept thinking that I really hoped they didn't put their massive fist through the window and grab me. I couldn't imagine what they wanted if not to kill me, and I was absolutely petrified. I couldn't think straight. Suddenly, I heard something akin to a very loud and thunderous roar coming from the front of the vehicle. I hadn't closed the curtain that separated the driver and passenger seats, and I looked up to see an even larger beast standing there. It made eye contact with me as well, and then jumped with superhuman speed from the ground to the front hood, and then onto the roof. It was very muscular and lean, all of them were and they were all covered in reddish-brown fur from head to toe. The exceptions were the hairlessness of most of the face. The skin looked leathery, and like it wasn't taken care of too well, and the eyes. There was something so human about the eyes, it shocked me stupid. I couldn't move. Three of them were standing at the window, growling, and banging on the side of the camper, and the one that had jumped onto the roof was stomping up and down on it. I screamed, and I asked them what they wanted, and then they all stopped again. I swear, I saw one of them, the first one I had laid eyes on, and I saw his eyes look from the table where my food was and back at me. It then dawned on me that they had smelled the food and come out of the darkness of the woods in preparation and anticipation of a meal. I grabbed all the food, opened up the front door, and tossed it out, closed the door, and then locked it again. I watched for a second through the front windshield as the one on the roof jumped down and all the others went running to it. They mauled the food and fought with one another over who got to keep what, and as they did that, I started up the camper van because I was getting out of there. I realized my back tires were spinning in the mud, 
due to the sudden rain that had descended on my campsite so suddenly. I screamed in frustration, because I thought for sure those creatures would come back to break the door down for more food, which I really didn't have. That's when one of them stopped what it was doing and walked to the back of the camper. Suddenly, I felt the back tires easily slide off the mud as the creature pushed my van for me so that I could leave. I was shell-shocked and unable to move, but when that same one looked at me and roared again, I knew it was telling me to get out of there, so that's what I did. I've got more stories of the time I spent on the road, but this one was by far the craziest one, and the one I most regret running off on. I wish I had stayed to try to further communicate with them, but back then, there wasn't much known about Bigfoot or Sasquatch, and having encounters with them was something that could get you mocked. I'll write about the other ones too. Thanks for letting me share. December's Bigfoot Marathon secret word is Kushtaka. K-U-S-H-T-A-K-A. Kushtaka. Comment the secret word down below, along with the title of your favorite Bigfoot Case Files video, for a chance to win the December Bigfoot Case Files and Bigfoot Encounters narrated giveaway. Official rules are in the description of this video and on the Bigfoot Case Files channel community page. Thank you for participating, and good luck. I'm 45, currently live in San Diego, but I grew up in Ohio. My first encounter was when I was 12. I'm pretty sure it was mid-September 1980. I was playing with my sister Chris and a neighbor Kevin in our backyard. We were doing long jump, and it was about 5 p.m., which meant Kevin had to go home, and Chris went in to prepare for dinner at 5.30. I continued to practice long jumping. From the east of our house, across the street, in the woods, there was this loud scream. It sounded like a blend of an elephant and a lion. The sound went right through me, and it triggered real fear. I looked that way for half a second, and fear filled my body, and tears instantly flooded from my eyes. Without thinking, I ran as fast as I could to the house with tears in my eyes. I remember having a hard time opening the door, but I managed and made it in. My older sister Cheryl asked what's wrong, and I said Bigfoot. I never saw anything. I don't think I ever even went into those woods until I was in junior high. They were very thick and full of thorns, with a lot of tall trees. My brother told me Bigfoot doesn't exist in Ohio, and assured me it was a deer. I'm glad he said that, because I would have been fearful to go outside, which I was always outside playing. I can picture this day like it was yesterday. We did have four apple trees in our yard. There were two apple trees between me and where the yell came from. Thinking back on it, my best guess was that it was hungry and eager to eat some apples. We had more than enough apples and never harvested them all. They often fell and rotted to the ground. Two other times I encountered something from those woods. One time, on my bike, something was going parallel with me as I rode my bike down the street. I assumed it was a deer, because my older brother was a hunter and told it was. Another time, something makes a lot of trees move as it was trying to hide from me. It wasn't trying to be stealth, like as it ran, but I never saw it. It did drive that same kind of fear into my heart as the first encounter. That winter, I started to venture into those woods, because you could only see into them then. I did find a large six-point buck back there. I didn't see any wounds on it. It was just lying on its side, frozen dead. I became adventurous about that year, exploring those woods, having a lot of fun as a kid. There was just a little natural water back there, mostly runoff water, that formed a small swampy area. In my early 20s, I became an avid fly fisherman and mountain biker. Whenever I had free time, I enjoyed that kind of outdoor activity. Southern Ohio mountain biking trip to Hanging Rock. Every few years, my friends would take the first weekend in May and go to Hanging Rock, Ohio. We would go for a weekend of mountain biking, and this was the last time I ever camped out there. It was about 2 a.m., everyone was asleep. I started to hear loud splashing sounds in the pond east of where we set up camp every year. It sounded like they were 60 to 100 yards away. We were the only ones there this year, which was not normal, but we were grateful we got our traditional spot. 
I thought the splashing sounds were a few fishermen trying to catch catfish. Then I remember, no one else is camping. The splashes continued about one every 40 seconds. It started to really bother me because I couldn't sleep. I never heard voices from the fishermen, so I started to think, maybe catfish jump out of the water at night? Then I thought maybe a bear and her cubs were jumping in the water? It finally stopped and I started to fall asleep. About two minutes later, there was something circling the tent. My roommate Everett was snoring pretty loud at that time, and I didn't want to move to draw attention, so I let him snore, thinking he'd stop or wake up. It went around three times. I was thinking it's a bear, and the only weapon I had was a small pocket knife in a tent pocket just within arm's reach, so I leaned over slowly to get it. This thing outside the tent knew what I was doing. Just as I got within three to six inches of the knife, it let out a long, deep snarling sound within two to four feet from my face. I stopped. I froze. I didn't even breathe. Everett stopped snoring because he heard it. Neither of us breathed for about 30 seconds. And then, this thing started to sniff around the tent, took one more lap around our camp, and left. Everett and I didn't say another word for about 30 minutes. I had two other friends sleeping in a Volkswagen van, and we thought for sure they saw what it was. In the morning, we told our other two friends, Jason and Steve, and they laughed at us. Everett and I went looking for bear tracks. We didn't find anything, but we didn't know what or how to look for a Bigfoot track. It never entered my mind that it could have been Bigfoot until years later, when I started reading reports about Bigfoot encounters down in that area. I've had rocks thrown at me while fly fishing just as the sun went down. That always pissed me off because I would yell back at whoever threw the rocks. I never got any answers. I've only smelled one once and the way people explain it smells is true. I've only smelled one once the way people explain it smells. I've been within a short walk where I've seen tall 50 foot healthy summer trees just fall over for no reason within a month of each other. I'm kind of glad I live in San Diego. If I still lived in Ohio, I'd be out in the field at night and my wife already thinks I'm crazy when I talk to her about this. Thank you for validating people's experience. That is sometimes enough for people who have had experiences to know that they are not crazy. I work as a pastor, so I don't share my stories often. Theologically, I seriously wonder how Bigfoot sits into the Bible. I know David killed the giant, but I wonder now if that was a Bigfoot? Hope you keep doing what you do. Thank you. I get a week off for work for the Christmas holiday. My parents often like for the family to come together and spend the holiday at their ranch in southern Colorado. It is located 10 miles or so east of the town of San Luis and about 8 miles from the New Mexico border. It is situated in the foothills of the mountains. This mountain range begins near Santa Fe and ends in the San Luis Valley in southern Colorado. It's a small community of ranches and farms. There isn't much to do there except work. The nearest McDonald's is an hour drive. However, the area is rich with mountains, fishing, and hunting activities. I began exploring the entire area as a teenager on horseback. I know all the canyons, the best fishing holes, and where the deer and elk like to hang out. I would get bored as a teen, and I would saddle up, and within 20 minutes from the ranch, I would be in the forest. My father asked me if I wanted to go for a ride on the horses with him. I now live in the city, and he knows I haven't ridden in quite some time. The weather was very cold, around 8 degrees. I dressed very warm, and we left. There was about 18 inches of snow on the ground. I really didn't want to go but I think my father was tired of riding solo since I've been gone and wanted to spend a little time with me. We entered the forest about 20 minutes or so later. The snow was now getting deeper, occasionally rubbing on the horse's belly. All was quiet and peaceful, and we had been riding for a little over one hour. Very beautiful country. We were both now getting cold. My father suggested that we cut through some private property and take a side canyon and start heading back to the ranch. I agreed. This was the quickest way back to the ranch, and the poor horses were tired and had been fighting a lot of deep snow. 
we dropped into the canyon and began heading down into it. My father was ahead, and I was behind 12 feet or so. The snow was extremely deep, almost to the horse's chest. To the left of us, in the canyon, the sun melted a good-sized patch of land, and it was completely dry. This area is filled with game, and we hadn't seen anything. I kept a close eye in that dry area as we were passing through. I thought I had seen a deer. I got my father's attention, and I said I think I see a buck. So we stopped, and sure enough, it was a nice timber buck. He was standing completely still, and well aware of our presence. Then we began to see more of them. I was amazed at how well they camouflaged. Here's where the ride gets interesting. As I was enjoying the wildlife, my father said, There is someone watching us on top of the mountain. I turned, and I asked where. He's moving, my father said. Dad, where? We both knew this area extremely well, and there was no way that anyone would or could even get up there. Just too much snow. My father pointed to the top of the mountain and said in between those trees, and then I saw it. It was huge. My father then said, That's not a man. He was now starting to freak out. It's moving, it's moving. We better go. My father, who has always been 50-50 about Bigfoot, was now 100-100. Here's what I saw. I saw a human-like figure standing hunched over, looking directly at us from the top of the mountain. It was about 9 feet tall, with shaggy-looking dark black-brown hair, and very, very wide. It appeared to have its hands on its knees hunched over and just staring at us. I was in awe. I wasn't scared. I wanted a picture. So I reached into the saddlebag to get my girlfriend's camera, which has a great zoom, and I realized that I forgot it. Ugh. Still to this day, I kick myself for that one. My father was still freaking out and wanted out of there, so we continued to press on. I never took my eyes off of it. I never saw it move. However, my father insists that it was moving before I turned the horse and finally saw it. As we rode down the canyon, we caught the only road going up the canyon. No tire tracks for quite some time, which we already knew. I was now 100% certain that no other humans but us were up there. I asked my father if it could have possibly been a broken tree stump. He said it's possible, however he claims it was moving, and there was no wind that day. What do I think? Well, since I never saw it move, and I did not have a camera to zoom in on the subject, I'm 50-50. 50% of me says it was a squatch, and the other 50% says it was a tree stump. It was in a clearing about seven to 800 yards away. I just don't know what we saw that day. My encounter was so shocking that I blocked it from my consciousness for a long time. I began to remember more and more of what happened. I had me a bad case of the jitters as the memory uncoiled. The first part of the story took me back to 1952, when I had gone to Orleans to start preliminary work on a logging operation with two men by the names of Lee Leary and Josh Russell. One evening, Josh told me Lee had gone up to Happy Camp, but not having transportation back, wanted me to take the Mercury and go up and get him. I had driven the extremely crooked and dangerous road up there, but not being able to find him started back alone to Orleans. It had been raining very heavily, and after going back a few miles, I found there had been a slide across the road. There was a man with a flashlight there who told me I could still get back to Orleans by way of a detour across the river. He said it was a dirt road that went through Bear Valley and would come out at the mouth of Bluff Creek a few miles below Orleans. I had been driving slowly down this road for about 20 miles, I guess, sort of daydreaming, when I saw it. Dimly in the headlights and the rain was a shaggy, orangutan-like apparition of a human. For an instant, I had the impression the shaggy hair of the creature was a hoary blue-gray in the headlights. An ogre, I remember thinking, but the thing swiftly backpedaled off the road and behind a tree. I automatically passed it off as my imagination and drove on by the spot. Suddenly, without warning, the car went into a violent and unreasonable skid. I brought the car back under control, but for some reason, glanced into my rearview mirror. In the dim light of the taillights and license display bulb, I thought I could see a savage-looking face looking through the rear glass. I continued on, and when I looked again, there was no face. 
So again, I concluded it was imagination. I had gone another quarter mile, I guess, when across the road was a small six-inch sapling. I stopped the car and got out, intending to drag it aside if possible. Suddenly, I heard the swift thud of flying feet and something coming down the road. Reality was upon me, and I remember cursing myself for not paying attention to what I had previously seen. It was the shaggy, human-like monster I had seen in the headlights. It at once started circling around me, snarling and acting very menacing. It kept this circling up for some time, and once came up quite close, and I could see its face reflected by the headlights much better. The eyes were round and rather luminous. The hair on top of its rather low and rounded head was pretty short. Its eye teeth were far longer than a human's. Also the chest and upper parts of its torso was rather bare of hair, and also kind of leathery looking. It wasn't too tall, not much more than my own 5 feet 9 inches, although it had a stooped, long-armed posture. Then suddenly it changed tactics. It would stalk off down the road, but would come charging back, like a bat out of hell, when I started towards the car. The hour was late, the thing was becoming more and more menacing, and I was almost paralyzed by this time, paralyzed by fear. Suddenly a plan of escape, born out of desperation, popped into my mind. Since the monster seemed to think I couldn't get away, why not? When it went down the road again, playing cat and mouse, try to get in the car and smash through the sapling. This I did, and sprang for the door of the car a dozen feet away. No sooner was I inside when there it was, trying to claw through the window. I jerked the car into gear, floored the accelerator, and I can vividly remember the wet sapling glistening whitely in the headlights as the car slashed it aside. I remember the scream of rage and frustration it then gave. It was a curious trumpeting sound, like the scream of a stallion and the roar of a mad grizzly. The car then felt as if it were being held back by something half-riding and attempting to stop it, but the powerful mercury proved too much for it, and after a couple hundred yards I felt no more resistance. To top this unbelievable experience off, believe it or not, I promptly forgot the whole experience. Then and there it went, out of my mind. Not even the next day when Lee asked me if I had seen anything unusual on the road. A few days later, an incident happened that should have brought the experience back, but it didn't. Lee noticed a big dent in the grill of the car and asked me how it got there. I told him I didn't know. Incidentally, Lee told me that something had tried to push them off the road when they came through on the detour. He said there's something strange going on around here, and let the matter drop. In the fall of 2016, I was living not too far from Medford, Wisconsin. Like everyone in the area, I was looking forward to hunting season. I had scheduled a trip with my friend, and I started preparing for this hunting trip just like any other trip. I thought I would get a jump on things, and I'd scout the area in advance to look for the best spot to hunt. The week before opening day, I hopped in my truck and I drove down a dusty dirt road, hoping to spot some game for the next week. It was around 10 a.m., and the sun was shining pretty bright. As I drove down the back roads, I scanned the area and checked out the surroundings, looking for any signs of movement or wildlife. I was the only one on the road, so I was going slow and driving slightly in the middle of it. In the distance, about 50 yards ahead, I noticed a strange figure. It looked like it was starting to cross the road, so I slowed down. My initial thought was that it might be a hunter or someone else wandering in the area, doing the same thing I was, but as I drove closer, I realized it was something different. This was not a person crossing the road, but it was a very tall creature. I had never seen anything like it before in my entire life. It looked both human and ape-like at the same time, like it was some weird mutant of the island of Dr. Moreau. I kept driving, and I wanted to get a better look at it. I drove forward to get closer, and then finally stopped in the middle of the road. It stood on the other side of a rather rustic-looking wooden fence, and was just about 50 feet away from my truck. I was close enough to get a good look at this thing, It had very dark eyes. I couldn't see any whites. The head of the creature was large and oval, almost pointy at the top. There were no ears anywhere to be seen, 
thanks in part to the head being covered in hair. The hair swept back from the crown of the head and almost came to a peak at the top. This entire creature was covered with this long, shaggy hair, and it seemed to be thicker in certain areas. Its chest and abdomen had shorter, thinner hair, and I could tell that it had skin that was slightly pinkish under the hair. I could see the skin through the hair on the arms and across the chest. The hair was between three to five inches long and very jagged. It had a reddish-brown color to it, making it blend in easier with the changing leaves. The face seemed flatter than an ape's face. It had a flat, wide nose and very thin lips. I could see the tops of the teeth in the lower jaw. They appeared to be quite sharp and jagged. For the most part, there was no hair on its face. I was just stopped on the road, and I couldn't help but stare. This creature kept staring at me too, through the driver's side window. I never felt threatened, which surprised me to no end, since it resembled an ape to a degree. Just to be on the safe side, when I left home, I made sure to bring my hunting rifle. It was resting beside me in the truck, but I never felt the need to reach for it. Granted, I was in my truck and I had the windows up, but I never saw the creature make any threatening or aggressive moves. This thing looked at me for probably 30 seconds. I had totally stopped in the road and I was staring right back at it. Finally, the creature broke eye contact with me and turned away. I guess it had enough of me, and it continued to walk into the woods. It had a huge stride, and it walked quickly into the wilderness. I watched it for as long as I could, but it finally disappeared into the trees. Strangely, it never looked back, which left me with a feeling that it was a peaceful creature. As I tried to collect my thoughts and understand what I had just seen, I couldn't shake it from my mind. I started to think that this is what everyone was calling a Sasquatch, I couldn't wait to get home and go online. I wanted to find out if there were Sasquatch sightings in this area and what others had been saying. Until I found out for sure that is what I saw, I didn't want to tell anyone. I did a little googling and I found that there were indeed several reported sightings in the area. The descriptions varied a lot, but for the most part, they seemed to agree with what I had seen. I spent most of the hunting season in that area but I regretfully never saw the Sasquatch again. In 2016, I went hunting with two of my uncles in a wildlife management area in southwest Oklahoma. This particular area was familiar to me, as I had hunted there solo many times. We set out super early, around 5 a.m., from Lawton to Warica. One uncle rode with me, and the other followed us in his truck. When we got there, we parked and gathered around my truck with a tailgate down to gear up for the hunt. We had crossbows and my compound bow, while I carried a little thirty-eight revolver on my hip, just in case of snakes. It was pretty dark, we could barely see, with only the dimly lit truck bed providing us some visibility. It was pitch black all around us, and then out of nowhere, it roared. It started as a combination of a growl and a yell, so loud and powerful that it rattled my chest. The volume was at its peak right from the beginning. There was no gradual buildup. And then the sound tapered off, almost like a scream. The three of us were taken aback, and in that moment, we all jumped into the bed of my truck, backs against the cab, staring into the darkness. It grunted a few more times before the ground beneath us started to shake, and it took off crashing through the trees. I grabbed my little pistol and I pointed it towards the direction of the sound, but we couldn't see anything, and I never fired the gun. For nearly an hour, we remained huddled in the truck bed, not saying a word. As it started to get light outside, we decided to get down from the truck bed. Each of us grabbed a bucket and spread out about 10 feet apart, but we all stayed close to the trucks. It seemed like we were trying to be tough and not discuss how terrifying the experience was but we were not willing to separate from each other or venture into the woods alone. We stayed there for a couple of hours, but the unease never really went away. Later on that day, we loaded up and decided to call it a day. On the way back home, there was an unspoken agreement not to talk about what happened. It's been over seven years now, and we still haven't talked about that haunting day. I have never heard anything like that roar before, and it was so close, sending shivers down our spines. 
The area was known to have deer, wild hogs, and occasionally mountain lions released into the wildlife management lands if they were caught near small towns. But this sound was unlike anything I had heard from those animals or any other wildlife. As it ran off, the stomping sounded like two-legged footsteps, and the crashing through the trees was deafening, lingering for almost a minute. When the sun finally came up, all we could see were broken branches and bent tall grass. The ground was hard, so we didn't see any tracks, and that marked the last time that I went hunting. While it was a harrowing experience, it has also left me with a sense of curiosity and wonder. I still can't explain what we encountered that day, but it was undeniably a powerful and mysterious presence. The encounter has made me more cautious and hesitant to venture into the woods alone, even in familiar hunting grounds. Sometimes, silence speaks louder than words, and the unspoken pact among my uncles and me to keep this encounter to ourselves reflects the impact that it had on us. As the years go by, I can't help but wonder about the creature we encountered, and what else might be lurking in the wilderness. But for now, the memory stands as a powerful reminder of the unknown and the hidden mysteries of nature. My experience happened in June 2002, at Big Reed Lake in Maine. I have never talked about what happened to me one night at a remote camp, because I didn't understand what I experienced. And the story showed me up as a pretty stupid Englishman, who didn't follow the sensible rules of how we need to keep safe in the forests of the north. I am British, a trout fisherman, and I had booked a week of fly fishing in Maine, and the local sporting camp dropped me off by float plane at the beautiful Big Reed Pond, 20 minutes flight from the camp. I spent the afternoon on the lake catching a few trout and generally enjoying being in the most wilderness place I had ever experienced. The only realistic access to this place is by float plane, there isn't any track or road within several miles of the place. Now looking back, this could be my imagination, but I felt really nervous out on the lake, and I am not really a nervous person. Something made me feel very lonely, rather vulnerable, but maybe this was just an urban Brit in the very middle of the huge Maine wilderness. About 7 p.m., I headed back to the dock, up to the cabin, and set about cooking the steak that the camp kitchen guys had packed for me. In the cool box, there were three huge steaks and enough potato salad to last me a week. I was only there for a 24-hour stay. You Americans don't like to go hungry in the woods. I ate my food and drank a couple of Sam's Adams ales. My plan was to lie down for about an hour and then go back to fish until midnight. Things didn't work out that way. I fell fast asleep and I woke up around midnight. Could have been the ale or the hot day on the lake, I'm not sure, probably a mix of both. I woke up and the only way I can explain this was that I was absolutely terrified, more terrified than I have ever been, but with no apparent cause. My whole body was shaking and it was like the cabin was charged by some kind of electrical energy. Weird, because there was no electricity in the place. The other thing I knew was that I really needed to use the toilet. Sorry, bathroom. Again, the beer. I climbed out of the bed, and as I started walking across to the door, immediately, there was the most almighty crash, like something the size of a car tire being thrown at the back wall of the cabin. The cabin shook. Then I spent maybe ten minutes listening to something outside walking bipedally, partly on the wooden decking and partly off of it. Whatever it was was incredibly heavy, Every step on the deck reverberated through the cabin. I could feel the cabin floor move under my feet. The animal was going through the things on the front deck. I heard bottles rolling about, the pan and the stove being knocked over, and it sounded like lots of things being trashed and dropped. I convinced myself that it was a bear. I have seen bear on that trip and on fishing trips in eastern and northern Europe. I have been told that this cabin was bear-proof and because bears were the only thing I was told I needed to be careful of, I knew it must be a bear. Stupidly, of course, I hadn't cleaned the plate or the pan, so I guess I had attracted the bear to the cabin. Dumb. An empty coffee can served as a bathroom. No way was I going out to pee outside in case the bear was still hanging around. Gradually, I started to calm down, smoked a cigarette, shaking like a leaf. I have never in my life been so scared of anything, 
What alarmed me was that my fear started before I heard anything strange. I laid down and kind of slept until the sun came up, and then I went out to assess the damage and empty my coffee can. The first thing I noticed was the cooler. It was about 20 feet away from where I left it, standing upright with the lid on and the handle closed. The frying pan was turned over, as was the gas stove. My very expensive fly rod, something I was really worried about, was standing untouched. The deck had a couple of big blobs of potato salad, which looked like they had been stepped in, and what looked like a half-human footprint, the heel half made in the mayonnaise. Two empty beer bottles had rolled off the deck, and I walked over to pick up the cooler. The handle was covered in potato salad. I opened the cooler, and the two remaining steaks were gone. A tub of potato salad was missing. I found the second empty plastic salad tub about five feet away. Two other full beers had disappeared as well. Whatever had paid me a visit in the night had taken the steaks and an unopened box of salad, two bottles of beer, and eaten half a tub of potato salad, dropped some, and stepped in it. Then, they had closed the cooler lid. I made myself some coffee and still felt a weird sensation that whatever it was, was watching me. The plane was coming to get me at 9am, so I packed all of my stuff up and locked the cabin until I heard the plane. I ran down to the dock ready to get out of there as soon as I could. We loaded the stuff into the plane, and the pilot asked me how the fishing was, and I told him it had been pretty good. The pilot was an old guy in his 70s, nice, friendly guy. He said he had only once, in 20 years of flying people to that camp, found people waiting for him at the end of the dock before he cut his engines. The last time was a couple of fishermen in the 80s, who told him that they had had a visit from the booger man. He was laughing, and I just smiled in a polite English way. I just said nothing, glad to be away from that place. I have never written this story down and told no one except my wife. I have enjoyed listening to what I think are some very genuine stories online. I think if someone experiences something like this, it haunts them or troubles them years later. It still troubles me 13 years later. I had no interest in Bigfoot prior to this event in 2002. I never thought such stories came out of anywhere except the Pacific Northwest, but I am no expert. As a kid, I saw the Patterson-Gimlin film on a British TV documentary. More than that, I must say, I didn't have any knowledge or interest. When I checked the BFRO website recently, there was a few main Bigfoot experiences. One of them occurred in 1970, about 30 miles south of my experience. Two veterinarians found scat from an adult and a baby creature. I wonder if the baby Bigfoot was now my nighttime visitor, 22 years later. As we wrap up the last of the 2023 Bigfoot Marathon giveaways, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has entered the marathons and shown our YouTube channel support. Thank you for listening to our videos and taking time out of your days to write us nice comments and showing us kindness. If you entered December's giveaway, I wish you all good luck. Wishing you all a happy holiday and a happy new year.